Testing one, two.
Or okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the uh, meeting tonight. So uh, we're going to start off with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd appreciate everybody's attention. So good evening. We have a very special person who's going to kick off our board meeting. I would like to invite Liberty View Elementary fifth grade student Oliver Epps to the front to lead us. Good evening, school board members, superintendent, Merrigan, district staff, and families. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Oliver. That was wonderful. We're going to take a picture, so go ahead and go back up there because mom's going to need something for her scrapbook. And our board president is also going to join you for a pick. Now, Oliver, I know your family's here, so give a wave if you're associated with Oliver's family there. Congratulations. You did a really good job. All right, we're going to see if I can get through this. For some reason, I all of a sudden got a coffee in a bit. So we're going to go with special recognitions. We have multiple to do tonight, and it is always a wonderful way for us to start off our Board of Education meetings. So this evening, it's a pleasure to recognize two outstanding teachers in our district, would Karen Stolman Henderson and Ann Soba please come to the front? <laughs> so Ann Soba, Blue River um, Elementary fifth grade teacher, and Karen Stolman Henderson, Blue Valley Northwest mathematics and engineering teacher, were selected to represent Blue Valley as candidates for the Kansas Master Teacher Award. The program recognizes teachers across the state who have served the profession long and well and exemplify the qualities of an outstanding teacher. Anne's teaching philosophies stem from one word, connections. She firmly believes in the importance of building connections with students, coworkers, and the school community and has done just that at Blue River Elementary. Karen has been at the Blue Valley Northwest since 1993, a total of 28 years. Karen played a major role in the expansion of engineering classes offered in Blue Valley and has a passion for helping female students become interested in engineering. Karen was ultimately named a 2022 master teacher along with only seven other candidates across the state. Congratulations, Karen, on this recognition as well as to both of you for everything you do for students each and every day. Congratulations. All right, would Lizzie Boyle, art teacher at Sunrise Point, and Kate Tankel, a Spanish teacher at Blue Valley North, please come to the front. Every year, two Blue Valley teachers are selected to represent the district as candidates for the Kansas Master Teacher, for the Kansas Teacher of the Year Award. This award, sponsored by the Kansas State Department of Education. Oh, that's adorable. No, we love children. <laughs> we love children. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, that is precious. Sometimes it's about those moments that make it all worth it. Well, this award is sponsored by the Kansas State Department of Education and recognizes representatives of excellent teaching in the elementary and secondary classrooms of the state. These two amazing teachers were selected from the entire district as Blue Valley's candidates for the 2023 Kansas Teacher of the Year Award. As you know, Blue Valley is known for its exemplary educators. Lizzie and Kate are two of the best. Their dedication and excellence in teaching don't go unnoticed, and we are so grateful to have those two educators for our students here in Blue Valley. Congratulations. Oh, 
I don't know if we're going to be able to top that because I don't know if the next ones are going to have that kind of cuteness here, but we'll give her a try. So next, it's an honor to recognize two student athletes in the district who performed at such a high level they were awarded for it. Would Grant Stubblefield and Jaden Wooten please come to the front with your coaches, Aaron Eim and Bruce Erickson. Okay, we'll go ahead and start with Grant. Grant's, I know what Grant looks like, and I have not seen him yet here. Yeah, probably at practice. You're, you're right. <laughs> well, he is an outstanding student and student athlete, so we're going to talk about him as well. Um, Grant finished his junior basketball season at Blue Valley Northwest this year, helping lead the Huskies to a 6A runner-up finish. You know, when there's team success, individual sex, success is soon to follow. Grant performed at such a high level, he was awarded the 6A Boys Basketball Player of the Year by Sports in Kansas. So that's a huge award. So we'll be sure to extend our congratulations to Grant. Um, but now we also have somebody else who has uh, an, something to put on the fireplace award. You know, you make sure your parents put it up there because it's big. We didn't have just one, but we had two. Um, Jaden was named the 6A Girls Basketball Player of the Year by Sports in Kansas. And those are big, big awards if those of you who have not been involved in athletics. Um, those don't come easy. As a Blue Valley High sophomore, she helped lead her team to the 6A state tournament where they finished third. She also led 6A Girls Basketball in assist and was second in points. Let's give her a round of applause. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, I have to say something because uh, you're the reason I had to go get new nails. Because at the state tournament, Blue Valley High School girls played three games. The first game, they won in the last second with a, uh, she went all the way down the court and made a basket. The second game, they uh, lost in double, double overtime. overtime and barely lost. The third game for the third place and usually when you're playing for third place, sometimes it's not a great game. It was an amazing game. They won in triple overtime. So um, Jaden and her Blue Valley High Tiger uh, girl classmates uh, did a phenomenal job. And, and I think the future is very bright for you, Jaden. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. We're going to take a picture, but a reminder that participation in high school activities and athletics is a valuable part of the overall high school experience. And these two, um, these two individuals that we recognize tonight kind of exemplify that. So now we're going to move on to our Distinguished Service and Excellence in Education Awards. It's an honor to acknowledge two staff members. These people go above and beyond each day in our schools and across the district with Lisa Barrett, Administrative Assistant at Morris Elementary. Please come forward with her principal, Kim DeFries. Oh, you wanna bring your baby up too? <laughs> yeah, her baby is, usually works our board over on the IT side. He helps with a lot of IT stuff. So his baby, her baby isn't quite as the cute one we saw, but you, you still got it going. You're just a little bit older. Okay. <laughs> so, and we're excited to recognize Lisa Barrett with the Distinguished Service Award. Lisa has been with the district for 18 years. So, Kim, tell us what is so special about Lisa. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of the Moore staff, students, and community, it is my honor to say a few words about Lisa Barrett, who you have named as the April Distinguished Service Award recipient. As principals, we always like to think we're in charge of a building, but the truth is, it is our administrative assistant. Lisa is the glue that holds us all together. She opens doors in the morning. She closes down the office at night. She takes care of us all in any way we need. Just ask Mrs. Mulholland, our school counselor. <laughs> she is a good friend, a loyal colleague, a voice of reason when teachers or parents or even her principal is stressed. Lisa loves all of the students at Morse. You can see this by watching how she interacts with the kids and how much she knows about their families and their siblings. 
She might be considered their favorite aunt. She truly cares about their growth and happiness. We are a family at Morse, and no one knows that more than Lisa. It is my privilege to work with Lisa and help Blue Valley celebrate her evening as the April Distinguished Service Award recipient. Congratulations, Lisa. I think there is a whole slew of your fan club out here, Wave. And we have, a, a, in, in addition to some current staff members, we have a former principal, Steve Frizzell here, as well as uh, Russ Kokoruda, who was there for a year as an administrator. And I think that speaks volumes, that people uh, want to come back and recognize you. And so, uh, would you like to say anything, Lisa? Just say, I... I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> it's because of them Aww. that I love going well to work said. every day. Yeah. You, you are the glue, I couldn't agree more, that holds Morse together. Every time you go into that building, it just exudes positivity, and you're the first person that we get to talk to. So thank you so much for all you do uh, for the students and staff and the families at Morse Elementary. I was going to say, I know the husband is here, so I wanted to give you a wave. I know we, and, and you're cute too. I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to go up to our next person who is our Excellence in Education Award winner. Would Emily Wilson please come forward with your principal, Nate Winslow? We are excited to recognize Emily Wilson, sixth grade English teacher at Harmony Middle School with an Excellence in Education Award. This school year is her ninth year in the district. So Nate, tell us why she is so special and a rock star. Well, I'm gonna do my best to give Emily all the praise she deserves, um, but she is a wonderful teacher at Harmony Middle School. If I had to sum it up in one word, it would be rock star. Um, in one phrase, she's the real deal. Um, she impacts our building in so many different ways um, that there's almost nothing she doesn't do or no part of the building she doesn't touch. Um, she's a true teacher leader. She serves on our leadership team. She's a sixth grade team leader. Um, she chairs several teacher committees. She's the first one in line to help us with professional learning. And she's always supportive of our school goals that will positively impact kids. Um, in the classroom, she's super strong instructionally. She is very creative in how she plans her lessons. Her students are always engaged and having fun when they're in sixth grade ELA or social studies. Um, many times they might not even be in the classroom. They might be in the courtyard or in the pod, up and moving and collaborating and doing things that um, they'll remember for a long time. And then Emily also does an amazing job um, impacting kids outside of the classroom. She's an assistant director for our musical and for our fall play. That impacts over a third of our building. Over 200 kids participate in those activities. And her and her uh, co-directors, I don't know how they do it, but every kid feels valued. Every student has a part. And at the end of the day, they have a ton of fun and they're connected outside of class. Um, Emily also serves as one of our cheer sponsors. And when she took over the cheer squad two or three years ago, it hasn't been longer than that. Yeah, five. Five. <laughs> it just seems she has tripled or quadrupled the size of the team, so much so that I think they look more like a high school cheer squad than a middle school squad. And we're having to order additional uniforms this summer to make sure they all have a uniform. Um, and then in, in regards to our culture and climate at Harmony, she has done a great job helping to enhance that with um, Nest Flex lessons, which we um, do to build community, try to reconnect the kids to the building after some of them were home all last year. And then she has also started a sixth grade honorable T-Bird Award that we give every Friday at lunch. And she does an amazing job recognizing sixth grade students that display those positive attributes that we like to see at Harmony Middle School. So Harmony is truly lucky and fortunate to have Emily. And Emily, thank you. Thank you.
You know, Emily, I've been in your classroom and I could not agree with you more. Every time I've been in there, students are engaged and, and having fun and they're learning at the same time. Um, they I don't even think they know they're learning. They're just having so much fun. But what really stands out for me is I think about um, any time I've been to an event at Harmony, I've seen you. Whether it is the uh, feeder game at the stadium, um, at our uh, district stadium for football or whether it was the play or teasers for the play, you're always there, you're always involved. And that means so much to kids, that connection piece. And we just couldn't be prouder of you and all that you have done for Harmony. So thank you very much. And I know you have some family here and I'm gonna let you see if you wanna say a few words. Okay. Yep. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much. This award means so much to me. Um, but honestly, it could have gone to any one of my colleagues at Harmony. Um, I work with an absolutely fantastic community. Um, I also just want to say that I feel like Grant Stubblefield owes some of his success to me. So just throwing that out there for that previous <laughs> award. Um, I had him in social studies. Um, and then um, just a big shout out to my husband, Dustin. Um, he runs the show at home. As you heard, I'm doing a lot of extracurriculars and I'm at school early and I'm at school late and I wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you, much love to you. Oh, so sweet. Congratulations. So next, we are going to be recognizing our KMEA three-year all-state students. And I have to admit, from the very beginning, these students know how to pivot because they were given an email with a little typo in it that changed the time of their arrival for tonight by 30 minutes, and they've quickly pivoted to be here at 6 instead of 6.30. So thank you, students who are at the last minute were made aware of that. You changed and were able to um, be here tonight for recognitions, and we apologize for that. Our fault. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is Janelle Brower is the person who leads a lot of this work um, district-wide, and so she is the best person um, to recognize these students, and I'm going to let her come to the podium and do that. Thank you for all you do. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening to recognize the achievements of 14 exceptional Blue Valley music students. These musicians were selected as members of the Kansas Music Educators Association All State Groups, which gives them the distinction of being identified among the highest achieving musicians in the state of Kansas. After a rigorous audition process in which students were evaluated on their ability to perform challenging literature for experts in the field, they were selected to perform in the All-State Ensemble for their discipline, All-State Band, Orchestra, Choir, or Jazz Band. These select ensembles meet in Wichita every February at the Kansas Mus Music Educators in Service Workshop, where their rehearsals and performances are an important part of the convention. The students here tonight not only earned positions within the Kansas All-State Ensembles this year, but they qualified during all three years of their eligibility. KMEA recognizes the sig significance of this accomplishment by presenting each of these students with a specially designed medal to honor them during the convention. It is with pleasure that I join with you in honoring these outstanding musicians. For those students who are present, as I call your name, please stand and come to the front to be recognized. Parents, family members, and teachers, please also stand and be recognized as your child or student is acknowledged. George Shre, Blue Valley High, clarinet. Harry Wong, Blue Valley North, alto saxophone. Ethan Guo, Blue Valley West, French horn. John Muldoon, Blue Valley North, clarinet. Please come forward. Varsha Venkatesh, Blue Valley Northwest, oboe. Irene O, Blue Valley North, violin. Yenna Moon, Blue Valley Northwest, violin. Julianne Zing, Blue Valley Northwest, violin. Daniel Cheng, Blue Valley Northwest, string bass. Anna Bayich, Blue Valley High, alto. Gracie Hernandez, Blue Valley West, alto. Natalie Palicki, Blue Valley Northwest, soprano. Kimberly Gibson, Blue Valley Northwest, soprano. Shreya Bhatia, Blue Valley Southwest, soprano. 
Thank you to our Board of Education for the opportunity to recognize these students this evening and for supporting the musical opportunities that have led to their success. Let's give them a round of applause. Several of our music teachers are here too. We want to give a shout out to them. So Dan Freeman, Daniel Kirk, um, Beth, R Richie Sullivan, got it right? Okay. Yeah. Mike Arbucci, did I miss anybody? Taryn's Oh, Taryn. Gervais. Gervais. So uh, thank you to our teachers uh, for uh, contributing to the success of these students and congratulations to you. I was blown away when I was at KMEA and I would pop into those um, sessions and really it is such high quality music that, that you are all playing and we're very, very proud of you. And that wraps up recognitions for this evening. So for those of you who would like to um, stay for the rest of the, of the meeting, we absolutely want you here. For those who would like to sneak out, now is your time. Hi, thank you. Congratulations. Okay, our next uh, agenda item is public comments. Um, we want to welcome those who are in attendance to address the board or listen during open forum. Open forum provides a time for individuals to address the board. In an effort to ensure an orderly and efficient and effective and dignified meeting, uh, open forum will be provided for up to 60 minutes. In an effort to give as many individuals an opportunity to speak as possible during the 60 minute open forum, the board will enforce a three minute uh, limit per speaker. After 60 minutes, the board will close open forum and will proceed with its agenda items for the evening. Whether you plan to speak or just listen, we're glad you're here because we care about the opinions and concerns of our patrons. If you do not have an opportunity to address the board during the meeting, you may address the board by email communication. I have a few reminders about open forum that will help our speakers to have a constructive and positive experience when discussing items with the board. When making remarks, please be civil and use respectful language. Please limit the discussion to the relevant business of the board tonight. Discussion of matters related to specific student or employee or not is not allowed. Instead, comments should be submitted in writing to the superintendent. Please remember to limit your comments to three minutes and avoid repeating the concerns of a previous speaker. If you have questions that require response, someone will follow up with you at a later time. On behalf of the board, I welcome you and appreciate your interest in Blue Valley as we strive to provide the very best education possible to our, to our students. When your name is called, please introduce yourself before beginning your remarks. As a reminder, we ask that all remarks are limited to three minutes. Let's get started. Amy Thomas is our first speaker. Hi, good evening, Amy Thomas. Um, I'd like to first thank you each uh, for your vote on April 8th to rescind all of the COVID-19 policies, um, specifically the absenteeism leading to masking. Uh, this was the right decision. Uh, thank you to the five of you who voted to rescind these tyrannical policies, and our children deserve that freedom. So thank you. Secondly, I'd like to express my great concern of the decision that this board made to retain pornographic books at our high school libraries. I'm shocked and saddened and frankly disgusted that anyone believes these books 
which contains sexually explicit pictures should be anywhere close to our minor children. The fact that our district librarian who was advocating for these books to remain in the schools sends her children to private Catholic schools should be all you need to know that this is the wrong decision for our children. Pornography is defined as printed or visual material containing the explicit description or display of sexual organs or activity intended to stimulate erotic rather than aesthetic or emotional feelings. These books contain explicit, explicit pictures of people having oral sex. They fit the definition of pornography. Access to these books should not be permitted in any of our schools, and it was made very clear in the meeting that there's no oversight and no records of these books being checked out. You're, you're willfully providing pornographic material to 14-year-old children. According to the Kansas law, state statute 215510, um, employing, using, persuading, inducing, enticing, or coercing a person under 18 years of age to engage in explicit sexual conduct for the purpose of promoting any performance in a visual printed medium, such as film, photo, either a profit, or the intent of arousing or satisfying a person's sexual desires is considered sexual exploitation. Promoting, specifically, is providing, lending, distributing, circulating, disseminating, presenting, displaying, exhibiting this material. Sexual exploitation of a child is a felony, punishable by up to 55 months in prison and up to $300,000 in fines. If the child is 14 years of age and the offender is 18 years of age or older, it is a level five felony punishable by life imprisonment and up to $500,000 in fines. According to the Blue Valley Board of Education website, your policy states the Blue Valley Board will assure that the district abides by all applicable federal and state laws and district policies. According to what I just read and, and just stated in the Kansas law, it appears as though the district is engages in, in, engaging in criminal activity by providing this material. How can you agree to continue to condone this criminal activity in our schools and what are you going to do to rectify it? Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Our next speaker is Tracy Stein. Thank you, Tracy Stein. My name is Tracy Stein, and I have four kids in the district. I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you for serving on the board. I cannot imagine the burden you must carry knowing thousands of families are trusting you to make all decisions together to benefit the greater Blue Valley schools. The seven of you have the obligation to collaborate and make the absolute best decisions for 23,000 students' hearts and minds. Now that is a heavy load which requires a unified district community for support. I'm not here speaking for the right or the left. I'm here as a community member who is longing for unity more than a political win. We've heard from frustrated parents regarding masking, critical race theory, sexually explicit books, pronoun identification, transgender bathroom use, and more. This isn't a Blue Valley School District issue. This is a nationwide issue. However, I have higher hopes out of this top-rated school district. Your belief statement in your policy manual says, quote, strong public schools require that the family is the first teacher, and both the school and the family have an ongoing obligation to support continuous learning. Second quote, strong public schools are made even stronger by community collaboration and support. Likewise, communities are made stronger by outstanding public schools. Are you making each decision with these in mind? I cannot unsee what I witnessed watching your special board meeting in regards to the two pornographic novels that you are that are in our high school libraries. Your vote of 5-2 says nothing more but that five of you don't listen to your district parents' concerns. You made one of the strongest political statements that night when you dismissed one of your board's members' alternative solution of just putting those books on an opt-in or opt-out choice for parents. If we are provided an opt-in and opt-out choice for our elementary growth and development videos, middle school suicide prevention workshops, then why can't we have the option of protecting our children from sexually explicit materials in our high school libraries? What is more concerning is that you are desensitizing the grooming of sexual abuse. Does exposing sexually explicit material to our children better them in any way? Does this have anything to do with their academic learning? Why in the world would you vote to keep the books without any safety measures in place for all children? Are you honestly comfortable with this in your hands? To the district families listening, the community divide on all the issues around these books, gender identities, and sex education is growing. The school family relationships have been broken. The family teacher relationships aren't the same and it's starting to affect our kids. We deserve better. We deserve parental consent. We deserve transparency of the school curriculum and the books read to students 
starting in kindergarten. The common goal of everyone here is to keep our kids safe, learning, and growing into who God created them to be. We don't have to agree in what we believe, but we have to respect it. And in order to re respect it, we must accept the differences and find a common ground for parent choice. There are plenty of parents in this district, like myself, who saw the public school as a safe place for our children to learn. I will continue to be relentless and unapologetic in my efforts to keep families engaged and to create a unified district community once again. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Bring your best for those trusting in you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. The next speaker is Oksana Teichlik. The next speaker is Jeff Nessel. My name is Jeff Nessel, proud and still somewhat stunned father of Elijah, the current prom king of Blue Valley North. Uh, because it was used by Hillary Clinton, the phrase, it takes a village, which is actually an old proverb, is scoffed at by many, which is sad because those of us with special needs kids know it does indeed take a village of neighbors, teachers, and school administrators, among others, to help with our child. My son Elijah has been lucky to have a variety of people interact in his life, especially early teachers like Miss Amy Sue, Miss Penny, Mrs. Norber, Mrs. Go, and Mrs. Everhart, and later instructors like Mr. Hale and Mr. Oleg, along with principals like Dr. Ostrowski and Chris Leglider. Who got it? These individuals understood the complexities of a child on the autism spectrum and went that extra step to make his life better. And for all the teachers and administrators who I have not mentioned, I'm sorry, but you understand because you get it. Your only agenda was to make sure all the students were treated with respect and dignity. I'm thankful I should got the opportunity to thrive in this type of environment. It is why I bought a house in the Blue Valley District over 30 years ago, because it was the best district in the area. That is why I am saddened by what is occurring now in Blue Valley and what awaits other students, especially those with special needs, who come after Elijah. Teachers and administrators are being usurped by parents and board members who, due to outside influences and money, are pushing their own personal agendas on kids regardless of whether or not it is in the child's best interest. Insisting you know what is better for the kids, like some members now do, instead of treating the professionals, plan and teach their curriculum is only the height of arrogance, but also of stupidity. Years ago, I was asked not to speak at a PTO meeting as my comments were considered inappropriate by the president of the organization. Why? Because my comments mentioned a variety of policies that were not beneficial to students, as well as the idiocy of certain elected officials who supported them. I know you will find this hard to believe, but I agreed not to say anything. Yeah, true. Not because I was wrong, I wasn't, but because it was the right thing to do for my child. My personal agenda was not more important than my own son's. I hope this is a lesson some members on this board, as well as some well-intentioned but misinformed parents will learn. Personal agendas fueled by national groups that do think nothing of line and funding candidates who follow their lead, don't care about the kids in our district, and care even less about the divisions and destruction they leave in their wake. It is destructive and is destroying our wonderful public schools, and it's up to all of us, but especially you representing Blue Valley, to make sure that doesn't continue. It means you need to put your personal agendas aside and let the professionals, the teachers, and administrators who have been trained and educated in this field do their job. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our next speaker is Jenny Cox. The innocence of a child. Who determines what innocence is? Who determines what a child is ready to see, hear, or experience? How do we decide when a child is ready to set aside old ideas for new ones? Or put another way, who determines when something else is prioritized over innocence? Kansas state law helps us determine this for our children under the age of 18. 38, 141 in part, it shall be public policy of this state that parents shall retain the fundamental right to exercise primary control over the care and upbringing of their children. So it makes sense that parents are to be informed of what students are exposed to, especially if our culture still believes sexually explicit material is not acceptable for children to see. And ideas beget ideas, emotion begets emotion. Are we verifying emotion and ideas kids already have or giving them ideas and emotions to have? 
what ideas and emotions do we want to flourish? There seems to be a disagreement. At the very least, some of us parents within Blue Valley are concerned once we became aware of sexually explicit books in some of the school libraries. How can concerned parents be listened to? What could be a solution? We need the opt-in, opt-out policy for parents. There are already other information permissions for parents in place. Um, nurse's office, for photography permissions, field trips, tra transportation, et cetera. Other schools are already doing this. I have a link in an email already sent to you on a school board I'm sorry, I already sent to you on a school in Illinois that is putting parent permissions on gender queer for students under the age of 18. So how do we determine what is objectionable and in need of parental permission? So let's look at current policy. So in part, due to time restraint, policy 4610, appropriateness of the resource for the age of the student with whom the resource is intended should consider emotional development, ability level, learning style, social development, absence of vulgar language, sexual explicitness, or violent imagery. In this school board, is the school board violating their own policy? It's worth exploring. We are questioning books that are too sexually explicit for children. That is our litmus test. That is our discriminating factor, period. And we ask what is the purpose of having this material in high school libraries? Since we, know high, since we know schools are not in the business of fostering sexual exploration and that they are in the business of teaching core subjects, there is no purpose. It may be said that a book that is not explicitly about sex or porn is fine. Rated R movies are often not explicitly about sex, but let's say baseball, for example. However, it can be rated R because there are two, three ex sexual explicit, explicit scenes. I have emailed each school board member a list of books that I believe break current policy. I highly encourage you to look these up, focus on how much sexually explicit material is in them, but warning, you can't unsee or end read any of it, and neither can our children. Another question to ask, are these books literally challenging, providing education in the areas of core subject? I believe Blue Valley is treading on legal shaky ground. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Arena Weaver. Hello, Irina Weaver. I was very disturbed by the uh, Blue Valley book hearing result on March 24th. I'm wondering what values the book, the books like Gender Queer and Fun Home add to our children's development. <laughs> how to masturbate, how to have an oral sex, how to penetrate vagina with a finger, how to use sex toys. Even the vendor, McCain, believes gender queer is not appropriate for younger high school students. You don't ad adhere to your own uh, policy, like uh, mentioned before, selection of learning resources 4600, absence of vulgar language and sexual explicitness. I wish the school board and Blue Valley South uh, School District would spend the same amount of energy on improving our children's academic success. Do you know that KU lowered their requirements for graduate last year? That should be a huge red flag for everyone. Yet your worries are to preserve sexually explicit literature at our school libraries. It is not your job. Leave it to the Play Playboy Corporation, the porn industry, and the recent addition to this list, Disney. We value the innocence of our children. Once the innocence is gone, it cannot be restored. It should be up to the parents to decide if they want to expose their children to pornographic material. Also, parents should have direct involvement in what books get selected for the library. However, you took these rights away from us and continued the grooming process of our children. And here's a reminder, that's a definition, uh, Wikipedia de definition of child, ch child grooming. Child, child grooming is befriending and establishing an emotional connection with the child and sometimes the family to lower the child's inhibitions with the objective of sexual abuse. Child grooming is also regularly used to lure minors into various illicit businesses such as child trafficking, child prostitution, cyber sex trafficking, or the production of child pornography. And also on um, personal note, I saw that you're on gender, you're gonna um, approve the membership 
with uh, national, the National School Board Association, I would consider not to join them because just recently they went against parents, which is unacceptable. Thank you, Irina. Next speaker is Sherry McCants. Hello, my name is Sherry McCants and I'm speaking on behalf of three parents. We all have kids in the Blue Valley School District. A couple of weeks ago, this board had a special hearing on two sexually explicit and some may say pornography books. The books are Fun Home by Allison Bechtel and Gender Queer by Maya Cobb Beebe. I encourage every parent who is listening to this meeting to get on any browser and type the title of these books, add the word explicit, and search in images. This helps to get to the information quickly. Please look at the images and the imaging, how this content would be rated if it was a photo. What about a movie? Are these appropriate for a 13 or 14 year old? Because this is the typical age of the ninth grader. These books were voted on uh, five to two, which means they remain on our shelves. These two books are not the only sexually explicit books in Blue Valley libraries. I found 10 different titles in all high schools. Three titles are also available in most of the middle schools, so kids as early as 11 could read them. Apparently in the US we rate movies, but not books. I checked several rating agencies. Everyone agreed that the two books described earlier should not be recommended to anyone younger than 16 or 17. The books currently in our middle schools are rated 14 plus, but these agencies yet are available to 11 year olds. It is extremely concerning for me that our Blue Valley District choose to expose our children to the vivid descriptions and images of rape, sexual violence, pedophilia, and pornography. Why do they need to deprive kids from innocence? Once you read these books, you cannot unread them. Once you see these pictures, you cannot unsee them. As a Blue Valley parent, I oppose the district's decision to expose kids to these books without parental consent. I hope the board will either remove the books with explicit sexual content from the libraries or move these books to the special library section that would require parental permission. I have another topic to share, and it's a teacher's sharing their personal lives with their students. Recently, a child shared that her entire social studies class uh, hour was spent on her teacher telling the class about his divorce and that he intermittently uses wife or ex-wife as he is adjusting to this. She was told there were, they were three weeks behind on where they're supposed to be with their schoolwork, and she doesn't like to hear about his personal home situation. It makes her uncomfortable. This is not the only class where teachers are sharing about their personal relationships. This is not a complaint to pick on teachers. In fact, we really like the teachers. The point is that her daughter has certain goals for high school and beyond, and is concerned that with the past couple of years, plus experiencing classes like this are not progressing her academic learning and bettering her studying habits. Now this is a perspective of a middle schooler regarding her level of discomfort of an adult discussing their personal story of divorce. I feel that what should be used but should, should be used is academic and not uh, social of thank you thank you sherry jacob osborne I'm Jacob Osborne, uh, members of the board, good evening. In the last few weeks, we have seen the Lawrence and Olathe school districts announce drastic budgetary measures in response uh, to steep budget cuts that both districts' leadership teams uh, allege no one saw coming. It is not quite clear how Lawrence found itself in such a position. In regards to Olathe, however, their leadership at least saw seven of their $20 million shortfall coming, for they knew the Kansas Board of Tax Appeals would be reducing the extraordinary growth fund mill rate as the district's rate of school openings tapered. Undoubtedly, Blue Valley is in a vastly different position socioeconomically than those other two districts. Nevertheless, the best leaders are those who prepare for the unexpected. 
I urge this board to study these failed cases so that Blue Valley may learn from them the warning signs of imminent collapse in an effort to prevent such dire budgetary cuts as both Olathe and Lawrence have done. At the very least, the district should ensure the budgetary office is tracking the extraordinary growth fund mill rate and its projected decline date, uh, ensuring that both are taken into account when calculating future budgets. With that said, I urge the seven members of this body to ask themselves this question when planning for the future. Whose absence is going to be felt more by the children? It's the teachers, librarians, paraprofessionals. These are the people who directly impact the lives of our students. Undoubtedly, this board shall one day face the reality of such a choice, and when it does so, I hope the administrators are asked to shoulder the burden equally. Now on to the proposed uh, mathematics standards the board shall be voting on tonight. These proposed K through five standards are inappropriate for such young students. For example, one assignment given in the presentation you shall see tonight regarding three dimensional shapes asks, what makes a good puzzle? How could a fifth grader be able to answer such a vague question? Another is, what strategies for solving these puzzles have you and your partner come up with? Uh, whatever the teacher taught us, uh, they're fifth graders. Uh, they're going to do what their math teachers tell them. Moreover, these mathematic lessons appear to call for students to self-reflect. Self-reflection is something that most adults have no desire to do. Say nothing of K through five students, especially over a topic such as math. Uh, then there is the reflection itself. Four of the six reflections are social emotional learning based. What does this have to do with mathematics? Another is for ELA. Out of the six reflection questions, only one pertains to the content matter. How does this make sense? So thank you for your time and for hearing my concerns. Thank you, Jacob. The next speaker is Dasha Teislick. Carrie Ann Baumgarten. Hi, my name is Carrie Ann Baumgarten, and I'm here as a community member. Um, first, before I read what I have to say, um, I'd like to, for a clip to be played so you can hear something. that stood up to me. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ant. <laughs> Ooh, one ant. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. It's just one ant. Yeah, boss. They're puny. Hmm, puny? Say, let's pretend this green is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> Well, how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? It's just one ant, just one parent, just five parents. I'm here today to remind this board and every board of education in the state of Kansas that we are growing in numbers, not just in the Blue Valley School District, but Olathe, Shawnee, DeSoto, and Gardner, and Spring Hill. Us puny little parents outnumber you 100 to one, and we are not resting until our requests are acknowledged, respected, and honored. We are on every single social media site that you know of, and some you don't, working together to ensure the safety of children in the schools. 
the very fact that you continue to deny and ignore the request of the very people that put you in your positions shows arrogance, narcissism, and betrayal of the seat you sit in to represent your community. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, pride has six meanings. Within those definitions, it identifies inordinate self-esteem and proud or disdainful behavior or treatment. The pride you display sitting here today and all the other times is abominable. You have been attempting to indoctrinate innocent lives with things parents do not agree with. While your seat comes to an end, being a parent and fighting to save the innocence of those children does not. Thank you, Carrie Ann. That wraps up our open forum for tonight. On behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to thank our participants. We appreciate that each of you took time to share your thoughts with us. Please know that the Board and the District Administration took notes during open forum and will follow up as needed with participants. We're going to take a five minute break for our closed captioner.
You ready? Motion to adjourn. Um, we're going to resume our meeting now. I'm going to call the uh, meeting to order. Uh, first uh, item on the agenda is receive reports from board advisory committees. I will start. Um, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee met uh, for the final time this year on April 7th in this room. Uh, we had two different topics. <clears throat> the first one, Dr. Kelly Wessel was in and uh, talked about the social emotional learning standards that have recently, or not recently, but that were approved by the Kansas State Board of Education and how Blue Valley has uh, implemented those within Blue Valley. She also highlighted something that um, anybody could go and look at, which is on our district website under a site called The Learning Connection, where there is a short uh, video around uh, what social emotional learning uh, is in Blue Valley and how we go about teaching that. The second half of the meeting included time for the committee to discuss family and community engagement, uh, specifically of how do we expand um, our diverse families and making sure that their points of view are represented um, within the community when we do a survey or when we solicit um, membership on committees and that, and that sort of thing. And the committee gave us some great ideas, but their number one thing is we have to make personal asks to our parents. Um, through our schools, uh, but they also gave us some community um, outreach organizations to work with and to intentionally work uh, to do that. And then finally, um, that since it was the last meeting of the year, we ended it with thanking um, everybody for being a part of this, uh, reminding you know, the patrons who were on there that their two-year term was up and that they could certainly apply for another two-year term. And we also thanked our students and wished them well. And that's it for the diversity, equity, and inclusion report. I think the other one that we have is Kyle Hayden, who is going to give um, the report on the finance committee. The Finance and Operations Board Advisory Committee met at 7.30 a.m. on April 7th via Zoom. The committee received some general district updates from Patrick Hurley and Amy Teisling. Director of Business Operations, Jason Gillum, and I presented on the work of the School Start Time Committee and recommendations for changes to pay rider busing. Jeremy McFadden, Director of Finance, presented the quarterly bond progress report. Jeremy also reported that the district was assigned a credit rating of AAA stable from Moody's and was assigned a credit rating of AA plus stable from S&P Global. Both those ratings were unchanged from 2020. Director of Accounting and Payroll, Nathan Mull, presented a summary of the district's investments since March 31st. Jason Gillum provided an update on transportation and facility rental fees for 22-23. Charles Rathbun, Director of Food and Nutrition Services, provided a financial update and presented the recommended meal prices for next year. Uh, those two items are on the board agenda for approval tonight. Jason Gillum and Jake Slobodnik presented the bids and contracts also on consent agenda for board approval. The Finance and Operations Committee meeting is scheduled for May 6th. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Dr. Merrigan. Uh, the next item is the um, approve the agenda for the April 11th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting as published. Oh, no, uh, board reports. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Let's go back to uh, receive board uh, reports from board members and the superintendent on items not on the agenda. Tom? Yeah, just real quickly, I've said it a thousand times for last year or whatever, I love normalcy, so I love seeing a packed house tonight and all the awards and, and the teachers and their families and people cheering. Um, love seeing all the activities go around, the great theater performances. I know several folks went to see Footloose, they probably stole your thunder, didn't they? Um, seeing our teams you know, or bands and cheerleading down at Disney performing and then all the state championships going on, our choir performances. I know there's a big thing this festival this week in regards to that, so again, it's, uh, it's, it's been great been great for for this community and great for these kids so that's all i got thank you tom jody yeah i i would agree with tom it's really nice kind of getting back into at least what we thought was normal you know before um seeing more activities um did want to give a huge shout out to blue valley southwest and uh footloose performance which was absolutely fantastic um i am constantly amazed um um, by the talent our students have, but knowing it wouldn't be possible without great teachers. 
they know how to give our kids the tools they need in order to be the beautiful people they are. So um, it just, it touches me every time I go to a performance. So um, absolutely loved it. I wanted to, um, just a, a note for the Ability Showcase that's coming up on April 29th. Um, I would encourage everyone to go. It should be a really fantastic event. Um, Night of Lights is also coming up, Blue Valley Ed Foundation. Um, heck of a lot of fun um, if, if you want to volunteer for it. I know they're still accepting volunteers, so, um, but a great kind of community-wide event um, here um, in our district. Um, and then uh, the Women's Giving Circle. Um, we meet twice a year with the Blue Valley Ed Foundation and, and uh, met, I believe it was last week, is that correct? And uh, they were, um, they were awarded their grants. I know many of you know this, but I thought I'd do a quick little shout out for the one that was chosen. Um, so um, it's called, um, uh, they, they voted to um, fund um, all Black, Blue Valley Middle Schools uh, for a creative work studio. So it's gonna to touch, be able to touch you know, all of our middle school kids and all the kids coming through. So it's gonna be really exciting. Um, they had talked about a stop motion animation uh, project um, with that and um, you know I, I my kid actually submitted a stop-motion animation um, scholarship um, had a scholarship opportunity in middle school and submitted a project and, and actually got a scholarship for college with that so there's a lot of things you can do with that so it's pretty cool I also wanted to do a quick little shout out um, I was able to attend um, um, uh, I was invited to uh, um, uh, do a tour of uh, a school in Goodland, Kansas, and St. Francis, Kansas. Um, it's a bit of a drive uh, for those who haven't been there, um, but um, the kids and the staff there are doing amazing things also. I'm just so proud of our public schools here in Kansas. Um, it was just such a great experience, and I had a kindergartner teaching me how to code um, so I hope they, they're not testing me on that uh, at this point in time, but, but they did an amazing job, so. Katie? Thank you, Jody. Hello, I actually know where Goodland is. That's, that's <laughs> my neck of the woods. Um, it is very far, very, very far. Um, so I ended, I think, our tour of the schools at Blue Valley North and OTE, Blue Valley North. Um, we got to see the girls' garage, which was super cool. Um, and their new gym, beautiful. Uh, Dr. Ostrowski is so full of life and ideas, and you can see that he really wants to bring some life into the tech area of the school, so that's pretty cool. Um, OTE was bright and cheery, as always, just like I remember it. Um, great teachers, got some hugs, um, and their principal, awesome. Um, we went to Topeka and um, met there. Got to hear some really good Q and A uh, for you know districts across the state, really, and it was just mostly the big three: Olathe, Shawnee Mission, and um, my takeaway there was uh, we've got some ways to go, but I think we're on our way. You know, trying to get things, trying to get kids what they need, that sort of stuff. So um, I wish I could have gone to Footloose. Oh yeah, yeah. So but that's all I have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Amy? Yes, um, I did a lot of the, a couple of the same things that these three have talked about, so just to reiterate that. I also wanted to give Kyle a shout out for the Finance and Operations Committee. I think in terms of patron participation, good discussion, and just the desire for the patrons to learn more and be helpful, it's been, it, it's one I've been a part of, I think, my whole time on the board, and uh, I just enjoy that time so much. So good job, Kyle, um, just on how you lead that group. Um, I also have to say congratulations to the Kansas Jayhawks and Christian Brown at Blue Valley, formerly of Blue Valley Northwest, so some of us have been wearing uh, blue for a number of days now, um, but uh, it's exciting for uh, Blue Valley and exciting for uh, KU. Thank you, Amy. Gina? I'll echo that, Amy. Rock chalk. Um, I just want to, first of all, congratulate Blue Valley Northwest Band. They went to a uh, Winter Park Ski Music Festival, and they won a superior rating, <coughs> best in class, and grand champion overall, which is amazing. So um, really proud of them for that. I also want to thank Tanya and the other Johnson County superintendents who've been pushing hard to get our special education 
um, fully funded at the mandated level. I know it's one of our uh, priorities as a district, so I uh, just wanted to mention that. And that I also had the ability showcase down for April 29th, so re reiterate that. It's going to be um, a really cool event. They feature artwork and performances by um, a really cool group of kids, so I hope everybody can make it to that. Um, otherwise, Jim, it's to you. Thank you, Gina. Jim? I I sat in on um, two committee meetings in the last week. One, I, I, I took uh, Tom's place when he was out fishing, and um, <laughs> and that was a well health and wellness committee, and the uh, a number of the uh, district nursing nurses and uh, coordinator presented. I thought that was extremely, uh, you know, it was fact it was fact filled. Um, there, I had probably had a lot of takeaways, but one that I would note in a in a difficult labor environment, it sounds like our uh, nursing team has done a really good job at being able to um, find and retain uh, school nurses. And they went into I don't know if they make that 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 uh, presentation public. I suppose it probably is somewhere. Anyway, it's it's a great presentation because it goes into a lot of detail in terms of what the school nurses functions are and, and the scope of services that they provide um, it's, you know it's, a, it's great information um, and uh, while let's see the day before or day after that I can't remember my, my days we had the special education advisory council meeting which um, was the last one of the school year that uh, was I mean there must have been 40 people there and so it was you know, great community engagement there was a presentation there by uh, Johnson County mental health in terms of the services very range of services they provide uh, but the the thing that I, I found um, especially interesting and it will touch on what Tanya you're gonna do a um, legislative update here Mark Schmidt took some time to just engage in an open dialogue about, in particular, the open enrollment uh, piece of legislation. So maybe I'll save the rest of my comments for what feedback I heard when you talk about that. Anything else, Jim? Is it uh, Dr. Mary? Uh, yeah, I have a couple things. A uh, couple of events this week that I wanted to highlight. Um, on Wednesday evening of this week, of this yeah, this week there are two different events. The first one is that Blue Valley High School has an open house, and that open house is from six to eight, and that's anybody in the community who wants to come in and see the extensive work uh, that has been done there around our bond. Um, our recent bond. So remember, all the mobiles are gone, and they have a classroom addition. They have a new gym that was inaugurated with girls basketball during Substate, and they also have a new performing arts addition, which was inaugurated this past weekend um, with a play. So community members are welcome to be there. Students will be there to give them tours, and you can just stop in any time between 6 and 8. Also on Wednesday evening at Hilltop Learning Center um, is an event uh, put on by our Drug and Alcohol Committee, and it's entitled Off Script, and it's a discussion with some community leaders there as well around um, drug and alcohol abuse and, and really what's happened as a, maybe as a result of the pandemic and it, just uh, within uh, our teenagers, so that would be another great event uh, to attend. Also on Wednesday, Wednesday is a busy day, um, we have large group music KMEA um, at our schools here in Blue Valley. So the choir is at Blue Valley North, orchestra is at Blue Valley Northwest, band is at Blue Valley Southwest, and they perform throughout the day, uh, both students from Blue Valley schools as well as Olathe and Shawnee Mission and some other area schools, and, and they will receive uh, ratings on those performances. So again, big day on Wednesday. Um, also want to give a shout out to Aiden Shaw. Um, Aiden is a senior at Blue Valley High School and he is a basketball player and he won the Darina Award. Did I say that right, Kyle? Yeah. So the Darina Award is the top basketball player in the uh, metro area and that would be the third athlete this year who has gotten the top in their sport. Remember Julia Meisner from Blue Valley West got it in golf. Um, Mikey Pauly got it in football. 
and now Aiden just received this in basketball. So that's a, a big honor. That was just uh, happened last week. Uh, and then I want to give a shout out to uh, my seventh grade students at Prairie Star Middle School on Friday. They served as travel agents. Uh, they had a project and I was their customer. And so I went over and um, they had researched a potential trip to Ireland um, that I said I wanted to take. Um, and they did a fabulous job. It was a great experience. And then finally, the last thing. Um, so Officer Ryndell has been at, I think, almost every board meeting for six years. Missed one, one board meeting in six years. And his last day with us is Friday. So this is the last board meeting he will be at. And so I just wanted to give you a heartfelt thank you. I know you're going to pursue kind of a dream career flying. He's a pilot. And so uh, we don't have any pilot jobs in Blue Valley. So I don't know if we could keep you. Uh, but we really appreciate all that you have done. Uh, you have been such a strong connection uh, in our elementary schools uh, and such support to both the students, teachers, and families. So thank you, Officer Rindell. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Merrigan. Thank you, Officer Rydell. We appreciate all that you've done for us and for being with us through all these years. Um, I, I guess the good news is we've got about six weeks left in the school year. Um, you know, I want to thank um, certainly all the parents for their support and the hours of volunteer tourism that they participate in to, to support the district. I want to thank the staff for always going through the extra mile. Remind everybody that you know this is a, still a challenging time. We're, we're working through the pandemic, um, and uh, working together for the benefit of all the kids is, is what is required and what's needed to get us through this quicker as opposed to later. Um, I want to thank the uh, superintendent for her work on, on the legislation. I know we went to uh, Topeka last month and met with the Johnson County delegation. And uh, we did uh, provide some, some testimony and some um, written positioning on how critical special education funding is for our budget going forward. And, and we are going to have to have some, some budget conversations. Um, but special education and, and the excess um, uh, funds that are available throughout the state are important. And they can make a difference uh, throughout the state for every school district. Um, as we continue to uh, provide those services and cannot emphasize enough uh, how it's being underfunded and that um, we would ask the legislature to actually fund at, at the legislative rate. Um, the other thing that uh, I'd also like to announce on, certainly on behalf of the board, um, we're going to be looking at um, next month, we're putting together a, a board committee on communications where um, we'll provide um, a structure and a format for uh, parents to provide um, input and um, feedback uh, and interaction with the board on a regular basis. With that said, um, the next agenda item is, a, is to approve the agenda for the April 11th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting as published. I move the Board of Educa Education approve the agenda for the April 11th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting as published. Is there a second? Second, uh, motion by Tom, second by Jody. Um, is there any discussion? Uh, seeing no discussion, uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same side, same side, same hand. Um, motion passes 7-0. Um, next item is approve the consent agenda for the April 11th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting as published. I have a motion. I move that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda for the April 11th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting as published. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, motion by Amy, second by Tom. Any discussion? Can I just one comment, because one of the speakers mentioned uh, in uh, the National School Board Association and <clears throat> the controversy that occurred last fall um, with the uh, a letter that was written, and at that, at the we were a number of us were at the national meeting um, a few weeks ago, and the new president. Make sure I'm getting this right. New president addressed. What's that? 
executive director <laughs> addressed that controversy and and said that they were committed to um, uh, I guess what I would say is a is a position or a stance going forward to be nonpartisan in their in the in what they provide, recognizing that there's people all over the the, the map in terms of where they might fall politically, and to um, so I think it's at least important for people to know that the the organization has taken that particular um, you know made that that statement. They've made some changes to, at a at a senior leadership position, and. Um, it's just noted because it did concern a lot of people uh, that I that I'm aware of. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you noted that, and, and apologized at the same meeting as well. Yeah. So I'm glad you noted that, Jim. Thank you, Tom and Jim. Anybody else have any other comments on the motion to approve the consent agenda? Seeing none. All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Uh, motion passes 7-0. Now we're going to move on to uh, new business. And new business is the sale of the series 2022 A bonds. And Jeremy McFadden, um, our director of finance, is going to kick this off. Good evening, board. Uh, I <clears throat> wanted to introduce uh, two members of the bond sale team uh, who have joined us here tonight. Uh, Dave Artiberry is the public finance managing director for the Stiefel Nicholas Kansas City office. Uh, he's going to uh, share some information with you on the bond process and the results of the bond sale from this morning. And also available for uh, questions if the board has any on the bond resolution. Uh, is Kevin Wempe. Uh, Kevin is bond counsel with Gilmore and Bell, so he's available for questions if there are any. All right. Dave. Um, thank you, Jeremy, and good evening, everybody. I'm David Arterberry with Stiefel Nicholas. Um, what I wanted to do, if you don't mind, is just give you a little brief update of what we've been up to. Uh, and when I say we, I mean us as the advisor to the district and bond council and staff um, since we visited with you at a work session back in March. Um, first of all, as, as Kyle had mentioned, um, the district did have its rating reviewed by Moody's and Standard & Poor's, and the rating was affirmed. Um, with Moody's AAA rating and S&P AA plus rating. So that's always good news when you can have excellent ratings like that maintained. Um, and Kyle and Jeremy both did a really good job of presenting the district um, to the rating agencies and responding to all those questions. So, so that was good news. Um, another thing that was done since the, um, that meeting in March was um, the, the disclosure document for the issue, the preliminary official statement. It was reviewed and it was finalized and it was distributed to um, potential bidders around the country. Um, we also made sure that the sale of the bonds got posted onto Bloomberg and, and onto the bond buyer. Each of those news agencies um, has a, a, a daily list of competitive bond sales. And then finally, on Friday and Thursday of last week, we called around to a lot of the firms that we know historically have bid on the district's bonds just to make sure they're aware of the sale and, and see if they were planning on bidding. And um, we could tell from those calls that we made last week that we were going to get a good response at the sale. Um, so all that led up to uh, us actually taking bids today. Uh, we met in uh, Kyle's office at about 1030 or so and pulled up the online bidding site. and. We could see that there were about a dozen firms lined up to bid, but as is the case on this type of issue, something this large, um, the bidders wait until literally the last seconds to submit their bid. So we could see with about a minute to go, there were one or two bidders, but there were 12 people lined up to bid. So we, we were holding our breath, and finally, about, with about 30 seconds to go, nine other bids popped in, so we ended up with a total of, of 10 bids. Uh, which is a great result, and I think you should have in cop a copy in front of you, yes, of, of the, the results. And this is based, these bids are awarded based on the lowest true interest cost. That's the, the TIC that you see there. And based on the lowest true interest cost, the best bid was submitted by Morgan Stanley and Company um, with a, a true interest cost of 3.105145%. 
Um, we reviewed their bid. It was mathematically correct. It met all of the bidding parameters. Um, they also provided the, the good faith check that was required. So um, this is a, a good conforming bid. And um, the results of that bid, the interest rates, have all been incorporated into the bond resolution that you'd be, you'd be acting upon next. Um, so a real good result. The thing I was particularly pleased with, if you look at those top four bids, um, the difference in interest cost between those top four bids is less than two one hundredths of one percentage point. So, real, really tight bidding. Um, I also um, provided to you, I think, I don't know if it's on the next page or the back side of your page, just I thought you might be interested in seeing just a little bit of a history of other recent new money bond sales. This doesn't include refinancings, but um, bonds issued for new projects that the district has done over about the last decade or so. Um, so you can see them lined out there. There's six of them and ranging in size from about $47 million to $125 million. Um, you can see the true interest cost on each bid, the number of bidders, um, and then a couple of uh, indexes, indices um, for, for bonds. The, the MMD index is a, an index of tax-exempt municipal bonds and then the 10-year U.S. Treasury rate. Um, the thing I would mention about this graph is that uh, if you took it a weighted average of all of the interest rates here over the last decade, that number, it doesn't show up on here, but I calculated it to be 2.62%. Um, so the district on average has been borrowing money over the last decade at about 2.6%, which is a, I would say a very nice rate, even though this sale was a little higher than that historically, you've got a really nice average. So um, welcome any questions you might have. I kind of rushed through things quickly and I know some of you haven't been through a bond sale before, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you'd have or any issues. David, real quick, thank, thank you for spending time and waiting um, here for sure. a couple hours. I know you have to do a lot of uh, the boards. So uh, obviously, the last time we had a sale was right, I think, a couple months after COVID began, right? They had that low interest rate, and that's just the way things were going. We're about a yeah. point higher now. That's just with the interest rate hike, right, the nature of things going. It, so I'm, I'm, talking, I'm kind of talking out loud here, but at the yeah. same time, got 10 healthy bids, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the fact that the rate was higher on this sale than it's been on previous sales has absolutely nothing to do with investors' view of the school district. In fact, with the 10 bids, I would say, you know, you're getting as good or better participation than you've ever had in the sale of the bonds. Right. That, that, that rate is solely a function of the overall market for interest rates, right? We'll yeah, with some rate. solid folks obviously bidding, bidding on these. Uh, credit rating in regards to, you know, obviously we're still rated the highest you can, correct, or close to or of, of any district. So that obviously at the end of the day helps a lot with the percentage rate we get here. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah the lower absolutely. the credit rating, the higher percentage rate we would get on these bids most likely, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. Um, the Olathe did a bond sale recently. What was their? Do you know what their interest rate? Did they, did you they know, I know they approved a sale of a. Um, they had a. They didn't do the sale. I, I haven't seen the results of, a, of their sale yet. I, I think their election was just within the last two months or so. Yeah. My guess is they might just be gearing up for it and, and have the sale within the next month or two. Because I don't think I've seen the results. Jim, Jim uses a little bit of a lag from them passing it with the voters, and a little bit of a lag. So are we on our? So we're on our since our last bond reference. Are we on our second sale here? Yeah, second this, sale. Okay. Yeah, this is um, this is it's um, the bond issue amount was sixty one million eight thirty five, yeah. and that was the remaining authorization from the January twenty twenty election. Um, the January twenty twenty election was. Um, one hundred and eighty six or one hundred eighty seven million dollars. Um, the first 125 million of that is what was sold back in 2020. You mentioned earlier, right? Um, and this is the balance of that. And Jim, your question might be what percentage they get compared to their bond rating. I'm not sure if that's. Yeah, what, I just was just uninterested. Show, I, it, the what I had thought I'd seen, but I've, I, re, I read a lot is that they had, were choosing. I mean, we the way we a point that I made this morning is that this bond sale relates to a bond that was approved. Uh, several years ago, and so it's not a, um, it's not, it, it was expected, and what, what we as a district did was to take down that money 
when, rather than just uh, take it all down and sit it in the bank and pay interest on it, let's take it down when we need it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, a, a rule, and if you want to get into the guts of it, I'll let Kevin Wimpy at Gilmore and Bell talk about it. But essentially, at the time you sell your bonds, you have to reasonably expect to spend the money within three years. So if you do a, a big election, in most cases, that expenditure of that fund is going to take more than three years. So we split the sale up into, you know, split the issue or the approval up into multiple sales. Any other questions? Anything from I hate to hear you not be able to, any question, any thoughts from you or? I mean that in a good way, I hate to see you not be able to <laughs> chime in. No, Did, I, were you at the musical Footloose by any chance? Or? I, oh, okay. I, I wish I had the rave review to share with you uh, okay. on Footloose, I'm sure, sure it was wonderful. I'm Kevin Wimpy with Gilmore and Bell, the district's bond council. Um, I can be very brief, just following Dave. I appreciate the opportunity to say hello. and. Uh, say hi to some of you again after the committee meeting. But yeah, if, if you recall, this um, this body approved the resolution to go to market several months ago, and Dave has given you the update now that we've come back with with bids and a low bidder. So by adoption of the resolution tonight, you'll uh, approve acceptance of that low bid, um, lock in that interest rate, and allow us to proceed towards closing in two weeks um, uh, in receipt of your funds at that time. So happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? I, I just think we had a kudos to these guys and our entire team and the district and, and the superintendent and our, our new director of finance and everybody just, uh, th these are, the way we fiscally run this school district is, is it's run very, very well, which allows us to save an incredible amount of taxpayer money and the ability to get these type of interest for bond sales. So I just, I wanna note that, that's just really, really important. We pass these votes and again, we'll be going for bond in a few years and talking to our voters that we're fiscally, <laughs> fiscally responsible with their money and doing the right things which able to allow us to borrow money at a cheap rate. So can, thank you. Uh, can you articulate this? These are um, also just for people's awareness. These are fixed rate bonds for, for a period, or do they, do they ever float or they're a fixed rate for the duration? Right, these are fixed rate bonds. Yeah. And you do have the option to call them, I believe it's a 10 year, nine or 10 year call option, but otherwise fixed rate bonds. So just, just to tie this up, and I know this really isn't like your area, you did the hard work with the, the sale today, um, but probably Kyle. So the rest, the remainder of this money that we, we have now um, from, from the approval, bond approval of a couple years ago, is finishing out projects. Can you just, just mention kind of what this is tying up? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, We've expended about 106 million of the 125 from the first sale, and we're two years past that first sale. So, you know, speaking to that three-year window, we're well within that. Uh, we'll have those funds expended probably by the time we hit summer, uh, quite honestly. Um, so, the remaining sale, this uh, 61 million 835, um, will primarily go towards the remaining FLE projects at our elementary schools, um, which we have seven lined up uh, for this summer. Um, uh, that's really kind of the, the big stuff. Um, we still have a lot of asset preservation uh, funds that we use, so um, pavement um, replacement, roof replacement, um, just things like HVAC replacement, so those are still going to be ongoing. Uh, that's another pretty good, significant chunk. Yeah, the Blue Valley Academy, um, there's $3 million to go towards uh, renovations to that facility uh, also. We have uh, a pot of money for career and technical education projects that we're still working on a plan of how we would uh, spend those funds, but um, uh, right now we're talking about going into middle schools and, and updating some uh, fax rooms and um, trying to modernize those spaces, so. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and timeline-wise, um, by the summer, end of summer of 23, uh, we should be 95 plus percent done with all of our projects. Any other questions, comments? Do I have a motion? I move that the, uh, do, do, do. I move that the Board of Education approves the sale of series 2022-A bonds as presented. Do I have a second? Motion by Tom, uh, second by Jim. Any discussion? 
Seeing no discussion, all in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. Uh, the next item is curriculum and instruction update. Mathematics. So a, so a couple of months ago, um, Patrick, you talked about uh, kind of coming out of COVID and, and refocusing uh, the work that we're doing. And this is one of the areas we talked about uh, mathematics. And uh, Kelly and Holly are going to share with you the work we've been doing, because we haven't just been sitting idle around any of this work. Um, and they're going to um, share the amazing work that um, these two have led throughout our district. So I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Good evening. I am here with Holly McCarty, our district math coordinator, to talk about a lot of work that's happened over many years in the area of math. So. Um, I want to point to this kind of driving quote um, behind all of our work. And it, it, it spoke to us because it says students deserve rich mathematical opportunities to be learners, doers, and sense makers of math. And almost everything we've done to this point really has, has been in, in service to this goal that every student gets a great math um, opportunity. So I wanted to show you a timeline and just go through rather quickly some of the activities we've done since uh, 2017 and 18. So uh, it, it, the timeline is stretched out a little bit. COVID gave us that, that little curveball, but um, we have made a lot, a lot of progress. So beginning in 2017, 18, and through um, last year, we did a ton of research and planning and training. So. Um, in 2017 and 18, we began, began by um, reading books, and we went to some workshops in Stanford. The NCTM, which is the National Counselors of Teachers, Council of Teachers of Math, math the most, uh, the largest and probably um, the top math organization in the country. Um, their conference is amazing. We attended that and um, some KSD workshops. The next year, we began to do the optional math mindset workshops. We had tens of teachers, dozens of teachers come and begin to learn about um, how to change our math instruction um, so that it is more engaging and go, goes deeper and has a more conceptual um, approach. Uh, our teachers did this as option. Um, they came, they learned, and over the course of the next few years, we trained hundreds, and hundreds of teachers after school in um, some mathematical <laughs> mindset approaches. We've been to Stanford Workshop. Um, one of our, um, one of the people we've read, read with and um, learned from the most works out of Stanford, her name's Joe Bowler. Um, lots of uh, great things from her, developed a relationship with her and her group, and they've continued to give us guidance on, how, on good math curriculum and math resources. So. The other big thing that happened that year is NCTM published the Catalyzing Change book series. There's one for elementary, middle, and high. We've read all of them, and they are kind of the call, the call to, to change mathematics for the better um, for a student's future. Um, all of the work that we're doing in curriculum and our resources based on these recommendations from um, this, this uh, series of research. The next year, continued to do math mindset workshops. Again, a couple hundred teachers came and did that voluntarily and um, began to see, after these workshops, some um, organic use of these new instructional um, shifts in math. So that's when that started to kind of happen. Again, it's pretty much centered around teachers that came and did the workshops, but begun, we began to see some really great shifts. 2021, 20, we were surviving and planning. Um, we had more planned for that year, but who didn't? And so we, but we continued to work, we continued to graph curriculum and write new curriculum with teachers as best we could in, in that year. So that came to this year, and this year has been a, an explosion of activity around math. We implemented a new eighth grade math curriculum um, using some of our ESSER funds. We were able to create a math cadre of over 100 K-8 teachers who volunteered, well not volunteer, we paid them, but they came after school four to six. Some of the best time I spent this year is with those groups learning about math. Um, there were three people from every school and they went back and were the de facto leader in, in their schools around math. We did math minutes, Adam Wessel, you can see, or Adam Wessel, Adam Wade, that picture. 
He, he is a former math teacher. Uh, this summer, he and I made 38 videos on all the little bitty parts of, of this. And these were sent out about, I don't know, once, three or four a month to teachers, just a three minute snippet learning. So we tried to keep the learning going. Um, we finalized curriculum and we went through a huge adoption process that Holly and her team led. Um, we had some de facto pilot classes, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and then the thing that's happening most recently in April, all K-8 buildings will have a math fun, fam family fun night. And um, those have begun, I think, Harmony Elementary's is tonight, and we've had a good, good response in those. And we have a quick video. Do I click? Okay, there we go. About the math night. Yeah. What does it mean to teach and learn math in Blue Valley? If I walk into a classroom in any one of our schools, in any one of our grade levels, we want to see active learners of mathematics. We want kids to be the learners, the doers, and the sense makers of math. And in order to do that, kids have to work together. They have to have rich problems that allow them to think deeply about mathematics. And if it's a really good task or problem, I should need to work collaboratively. But when you go into that classroom, you're gonna hear noise, you're gonna hear excitement, you're going to hear kids working together. They may be all around the room, moving in different directions. It's not what you're probably gonna see or what you might remember about sitting in a desk and just taking notes or doing a worksheet of 20 problems. So tonight we are having families come to school and we have a bunch of different math activities. I think it's really exciting as an educator to have this opportunity because we get to see parents and students engage with math in a fun and exciting way. Previously, you know, parents were taught that you, know, you memorize these things and memorizing multiplication facts and so this shift is to help, I think, ultimately prepare students for the real world to be able to apply concepts more. I mean, the greatest thing about math is that it is so hands-on and there's so many opportunities to have manipulatives in their hands and to be able to create and discover and just embed it in so much of what we do in kindergarten and how we play. And so just to see them being able to take something that's learned in a math lesson and just apply it throughout everyday life and them just cheering and being so happy about it being math time really shows just how engaging math can be for the kids. Jake and the communication department put together for us. We'll pop it up on our uh, learning uh, connection website. But it gives you a good, a good, you know, math is a, is something you do. And in that video, I think it was very evident. It's something that kids engage in. It's it's a it's a collaborative thing where people can learn from one another. In the process of all this, multiple years, workshops, a couple hundred teachers trained, IDCs, super jazzed about math. That we, we, we came to have some, we called them pilot classrooms, but they weren't official pilots. They were de facto pilots because we had groups of teachers who attend these workshops and then go, hey, we're going to try some of the, the, that stuff. And they'd get their principal involved in supporting and their IDC. And eventually we had these kind of little pockets where this, this type of mathematics instruction and learning were happening. So um, here's just an example of what the, the shift looks like and feels like. So this is an activity from a fifth grade classroom around, um, around solids and, and volume. So you can see it has the target and the kids are very clear about their targets. Um, and and it, it clearly states what they're trying to learn mathematically. The great thing about this approach to mathematics is it lets you integrate skills. And like Holly mentioned on the video, it's not a, a, a set of worksheets. Um, it has different skills that you work in. So the listening speaking component of ELA, this teacher chose to talk about the skills they're developing in students with respect to a collaborative discussion. This is a life skill that we want all our students to leave with. And this is worked into a math lesson. Additionally, you can see there's more things <coughs> around a relationship sales, social awareness. These are life skills. Um, communicate clearly, value and respect people by showing them they under, understand their perspective, 
effectively uh, manage my time and then manage myself and emotions. These are all fantastic skills that this teacher, not only are they teaching the math concept, they're teaching these life skills in the context of this math activity. So that, that, that's how, it can be, how different skills can be integrated. In the explore part, they're able to get hands on. Um, they, build, they actually build this cube. It asks open-ended questions so, so students can hear what one person says, build on their idea, question each other, challenge each other. And that's, that's why those communication skills are so important. Uh, again, discuss. These, again, are open-ended questions. How did you use images to help you? That's modeling. And, and when, have you ever had a math, a math problem in your head and you have to draw it out? Teaching, that's, that's not a skill every kid has. We have to teach that. It works in different parts of their life, too. Um, and then inside the solid, things they can't see. So they're making conjectures, and they use that big fancy word. You, it's really cute to hear a first grader say a conjecture. And they test their conjecture, and they open it up, and they, they look and see. And then they finally, um, they extend it um, beyond just what is a solid and what, does, what is the volume. And, and they ask questions like, what makes a good puzzle? It's an open-ended question. It's something that has lots of ways to find an answer to. So um, not only are they learning math, but they're learning some life skills along the way. We absolutely, in this approach, get to the point where we teach um, that volume has a formula, but we don't start with the formula. It's kind of it's a discovery piece. Um, I would say we don't ever have to teach it. Yeah, because they, they figure it out. They figure it and out. And they can visually see when they go to find the volume of something else um, how that base makes the difference no matter what it is. So we don't have to teach it. They get to figure it out as the teacher facilitates or works with those kids that might struggle with a piece. Right. So um, that's just an example of how one teacher took, um, took this type of approach to math. Um, I'm going to show you some data. I absolutely will give that it is cherry picked because we have an in that's small. But there are um, the, the classrooms that we know about that were kind of taking math in this approach. We went and pulled their data and compared it to other classrooms in that same grade level. So again, the numbers, the numbers, the in is smaller. But um, here's what I have for you. So just to, so you know what you're looking at. Fall 2020 to spring 21, so this is last year, beginning of year to end of year, third and fourth grade. Nationally, um, percent meaning growth goal. So the national norm is set at 50%. So they, they pick the average. So anything over 50 is good, which is kind of counterintuitive. But anything over 50 is good. If you're in a Blue Valley classroom, our average is 67. That's, that's good. NWEA would say that is a good, that's a good score. So if you're in Blue Valley, you kind of get a, you on average hit about 70% higher than a kid nationally. If you are in one of these de facto classrooms, you can see the number is, goes to 80% in third grade and 67 in fourth grade. Um, effectively, if you look at the, the boost that you get, it's, it's, it's significant. So we have a little bit of data. Um, here's another bit of data that we're collecting with these pilot classrooms. Um, here's another way to look at this. So this is fall 2020 to winter 2022. So this is the mid-year dip this year. What you're seeing is a quadrant chart. This is NWEA math. Across the top is achievement in percentile, and vertically is growth. So what the green represents is students who are uh, achieving higher than norm and growing more, right? So if you're on the right, you're, you're achieving higher than average. And if you're above the midline, you are growing higher than average. So the best case scenario is that kids are in the green. Kids that are over the vertical line are growing at a good rate. So we want to see kids over that vertical line and the horizontal line. We want to see kids to the right of that. Um, and if you look, this is a solid, um, this is a solid fifth grade class. Uh, again, 50% on that top number is considered uh, a, the average score nationally. And then you want your kids, all of your kids, 100% of your kids to, to meet your uh, growth target. And that's the aggregate for this class. So in this class, aggregate 
102% of the growth goals, if you added them all up, were achieved. This is a good, solid classroom. When you take this chart and you go to our de facto classrooms, the chart I just showed you is D. You have A, B, and C are our de facto pilot classrooms, and you can see many more kiddos up in that top right corner. What that tells us is that in these classrooms, that this approach to mathematics is not only good for kids who achieve, an average, a typically achieving kiddo, but it's good for kids who are high achievers. And that is something we were looking for in, in the approach to mathematics and the resource, because we have a ton of kids who do well in math, and we didn't want them to grow less because they're so high achieving. So we have, like I said, we have some initial data that we feel is, um, is, is encouraging. I, again, numbers low, and I'm cherry picking just because I'm picking the classrooms that I know are taking this approach, but it's looking positive. So we're encouraged by those results, and we'll be monitoring the heck out of it in the next few years. So, so that comes to this year, um, or this next year. We just Thursday announced that we are going to adopt the iReady math program. It's a K-8 math program. I'm very excited about it. It has a full suite of assessments, diagnostics, unit tests, the whole kit and caboodle, um, a core, good core program that aligns with the approach we're, we've been teaching for a while, and then an intervention piece. So, um, and again, we're going to use all those manipulatives. Um, we have a great team working on that. Um, so we'll have a new K-5 curriculum and K-8 resource. And then our, our efforts, a lot of our efforts will shift, shift to um, implementation, which honestly is probably the harder part of all this. So we still have a ton, ton, ton of work to do. So that is kind of where we have been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, this is just a quick blip of what's coming up here soon. In April, we're ordering the resource, we're doing the family nights, uh, we do PL on the 19th around math. In June, we're going to do a two-day unconference. We're really excited about that, giving teachers time to come in and work with one another. August, again, we'll hit some PL on the resource and the curriculum, and then that PL will just, that support will continue through 22-23. This has been a huge undertaking by literally a couple hundred people. So. Um, I'm standing up here speaking about it, but you have to understand that Holly has been amazing. She's had this math steering team. All the elementary principals and middle school principals have been through training throughout the year. We have over 100 people in the math cadre. Those folks are working hard in their building to, to push math forward. Our instructional design team has been absolutely um, key special education leaders. They're helping us better understand when students struggle with mathematics and, and how we can help. So they've been along on the ride and every single teacher has given feedback, engaged in PL, and um, has been part of the adoption process. So um, again, huge undertaking, lots of thank yous to go around. Um, big, big, big team effort. Do you have anything else? You want to I just say? think that a lot of the teachers that we've been lucky to work with over these math mindset workshops over the years, the cadre and the learning, the excitement mm -hmm. around teaching math um, from our teachers and especially elementary teachers because sometimes that can be an anxious part of their day and the excitement that they are feeling and when they are seeing kids do it, the emails I get and the things are like, they did do it, they did it, you were right, they could do it. And, I've been lucky to go into elementary classrooms and teach big groups of kids and um, the excitement and the joy of this low floor, high ceiling where all kids can get in and get involved is really exciting. So we will take any questions. Hey, Kelly, just to reiterate, um, all teachers, uh, elementary and middle, had a, a voice in the adoption of a new resource. Yes, actually we, they did multiple feedback loops. Uh, they had presentations and in the end, when it came down to the final two, the math cadre narrowed it to final two. It was the teacher's vote and their, and their voice. Those, that data is what put it over the edge for the one we picked. So they played a key role in fact. So. Thank you. Yep. Amy. I was just going to say, Holly, you sort of touched on my question just a second ago, but one of our speakers tonight, I think, had read the presentation and just what you flipped through just now had some concerns about 
I, I would say, can kids do it? Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds like, you know, the answer is yes, but anything else that you would add to that? I think a lot of times we make the assumption a kid can't do something, right? So we think we have to teach them every piece and every step before we do that. And our kids um, can do a lot. They come to us as kindergartners, they are curious about the world, and they are curious about the world with numbers. And sometimes we start to take that away in second grade and third grade and go to algorithms. So um, it amazes me what the kids do. I've done number talks with kids um, all the time, and what they come up with, and their teachers in the room are like, said that they said like they can't even believe um, you know what the kids come up with so it's it's definitely doable for all of our kids and not only is it doable it takes them to the next level it makes them deeper mathematical thinkers and it makes them stronger to go forward in more stem fields and one other question so outside of the um, regular standardized testing how do quizzes and tests look different for students than maybe in the past so it's a lot of a lot of stuff that we are working on with teachers, um, and even our high schools have started to do different things. You know, kids can can talk about math. Kids can talk to us. It doesn't always have to be paper and pencil. They can do presentations. They collaborate with each other. If you're working on something in mathematics and your overall goal is what you want them to have at the end, you can have them present at the end and give them a whole you know a different problem that they're not <laughs> mimicking your steps to just get done, but they're having to use what they learned in order to solve a new problem. So it is part of our assessment, and with our new um, resource, iReady, they have some great things. All of their um, questions that they have are done by standards, which is very nice so that we can pull those and work with our curriculum. But again, it's continued process as we continue to understand there are other ways to assess, and the combination of both is what's key. Mm -hmm. a, lot of perform a lot of performative type things, so giving is, problems and having kids solve them. Is it difficult for staff sometimes to make the transition? You know, it, it definitely is a change. They move really from a, a to, into a facilitator. We're asking questions and getting highly skilled at asking questions and um, anticipating misconceptions becomes kind of their role. The good news is the resource iReady very much supports that and gives them what they need to be able to do this type of approach. Um, I think without a quality resource, it'd be, it would be challenging. I think the resource will absolutely make a huge difference, and I'm pretty sure that's why the teachers picked it. And the, the professional learning that we've yeah. also done, yeah. because it's not like it's, for, even though we're going to implement the curriculum this year, the vast learning has been going on for years, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of the teachers will have me come out to do a lesson because they just want to see it, and afterward they're like, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And once they feel it with their kids, it's pretty much all it takes. Yeah. I would say one thing that has made all the difference in the world is coaching. So we've trained the instructional design coaches ahead of the teachers, and they are in the trenches side by side working with them. So a um, huge shout out to the instructional design coaches who, who have made the difference for our teachers on this. Yep. What else? So um, there, I just have a few Make sure I understand kind of what the trajectory is here. Mm -hmm. So I had done, when I saw this presentation, I just did a little uh, background reading on catalyzing change and what drove NCTM to, to um, you know, uh, write those, those, work, those books. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm interested to know whether this is the direction we're going because what my understanding is is that one of the objectives has been of, NCTM was to, to end the tracking, mm -hmm. early on tracking of poor math performers and higher math performers as early as elementary school um, so that even like say sixth grade you got kids that, that are you know, already into algebra too mm -hmm. at some schools around here. My daughter was um, and she was like alone in a class and then I've, but I've, I've had you know, poor math uh, students in my, and so that, when I understand it, is there's, there's really, there's moving away, particularly when you get into high school, no mm -hmm. honors classes any longer, mm -hmm. at least that's the way this is, is one of the, the objectives, there might be an honors designation, but you group everybody together, it's also, so there's not a tracking of students, but there's also not tracking of teachers, where you get the worst math <coughs> teachers teaching the, the most struggling students. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that is, because uh, that's an interesting theory. 
You know, I mean, I, I'm interested to know if that's where, where you, you see it going. You know, um, I think we're going to have to wait and see. I think it's really important to meet the needs of our kids in our community. So we have two different tracks for math with, with um, advanced and, and, on, and on level. Um, we are hoping that this new approach to math serves students better at all ends of the spectrum. And when that happens, we're hoping to have the conversation about does it make sense for a sixth grader to pick their math track for the next six years of their career when they're 11? Or is it something we wait and then it becomes more, uh, more um, you, you pick your path more in high school? So I don't know that we have it predetermined, but we are hoping that this approach to math um, serves our higher achieving students better. There's lots of cases. I'll talk to parents where they're higher achieving students and we'll, we'll talk about differentiation and they continue to say, you know, my kid's still not being served well in the on-level math class. I want to talk about, you know, going to that next level. When Holly said low floor, high ceiling, that's exactly what this, this conversation is about, is helping teachers realize that um, all kids can work on the same task, but you can take it to a depth. And so, <laughs> Um, I think it's yet to be seen, but you're right. The um, NCTM advocates for no, no like middle school, two levels of middle school. Um, I think we're just gonna have to wait and see um, if that's something our community and our teachers wanna consider or not. So just a few other uh, questions on this. So a lot of our um, students in the district do a lot of math after school. You know, it's like instead of going to baseball practice, they go to Kulan or Math Monkey. And it's pretty, that's a, most of those programs are pretty traditional, you know. Mm -hmm, very much. Do a gazillion problems each day and drill it into your head and then go on yeah, Saturday morning, et cetera. <laughs> um, you know, you know I'm, I'm, my guess is those are the best performers later on in our schools. Um, I just, just looking from my, my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering how, how you, I mean, I, how does this like stack up to that and how is it different? And So I would say what this does is it goes for depth. And we have a lot of students, particularly in upper elementary, that are good math performers, I think what Holly would say, where they know, they know the algorithm, they know how to add fractions, but they may or may not understand the underlying conceptual pieces of what it means to have a fourth of a half. And that that's an eighth. And so um, whilst a lot of kids are very successful in that, we also see a, a, a large number of students who do accelerate and get to high school and are lacking a conceptual understanding because maybe they accelerated too quickly. So our goal is to have a very strong conceptual understanding as a basis of the math program. Mm -hmm. Memorization can only get you so far. Yeah. Um, and as a former calculus teacher, you can you see that. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't mean that Math Monkey or the other places are bad. Um, it just means are they just learning a procedure to move on, but never really understand why they're doing something. And if they want to take an engineering path, if they want to take a real strong mathematical path, it will catch up with them not having an understanding. Um, I've, I've seen it. Um, but more importantly, it's math is so much more than a rote problem. Um, we look at our data science in the world today and these two new fields that are coming out that kids have to be able to analyze and problem solve and work. And there's no one little formula that just is going to work. So there's depth. The depth is very important. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer that the, your best uh, writers are people that are good at math because they just learn how to think. And they do it, you know, the younger you, you get it, the better. So, you know, I, I believe in that. The other thing that I understood, at least from some of what the NCTM was, was trying to get at, was um, U.S. stinks in terms of its overall comparative math performance to other countries. So, um, and I, there's a lot of reasons for that. We're a big, diverse country. But um, I'm wondering if, if, this approach is taken in other, in you know, like Japan or China or wherever the best you performers can are. Speak to that, yeah. So, um, in for instance, Japan is one country where, if they go into a high school math classroom, you will see usually one problem on the board, one problem. 
and that is what the kids will work on the entire class period. The teacher is facilitating, the teacher is not up at the board, having kids take notes, they are diving into a deep problem that they are doing. So when we talk about kids being the learners and doers of math, they're the ones doing it. On the flip side of that, you have to remember sometimes you're comparing apples to oranges, because um, in Japan, for instance, they track very young. And so once they get to a certain point, there's a test that they take. And if they don't pass, they go this way or this way. So you're looking at numbers that are a little different because we don't do that. So you have to take the whole picture there and look at it. But yes, other countries do it differently. A lot of other countries do it our way also, but we are the ones that are towards the bottom. Yep, I, th I would say that the countries that we we actually looked at some, the ones that are the higher are, are going towards a conceptual understanding of math and not a memorization um, basis. Yep. So, lots of math. Anybody else? Um, is this the program we purchased last year? No. This big one in our memo? Nope. No? Okay. I was just curious. We, we did not at. purchase it last year. No, it, it was in your consent agenda tonight for purchase. So if <laughs> for, you saw it in the packet next and for next year, okay. the iReady Curriculum Associates, I think is the name of the mm -hmm. vendor. And it, it is used by locally Spring Hill. Spring Hill. Anybody Spring else Hill. locally? Uh, not like Geary the, County, yeah. Spring Hill, Manhattan. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So it's actually super, it's coming it's on strong. <laughs> okay. Coming on strong. Thank you both. Yep. Yep. Thank, Thank you both. Uh, we need to let our closed captioner take a break, so we're going to take a five minute break.
supposed to have one this Saturday. Yeah, one award. Then they called me about a week what? ago and said, we decided yeah. we're not doing it. Oh, it's an honor that they do it. You ready? Are we ready to resume? Okay, so let's get started and resume with the next agenda item. That's going to be report and recommendations for the transportation services for the 2022-23 school year. Kyle? Okay. It's hard. It's always hard to follow those reports because I get you're up here smiling and nodding and like <laughs> I just don't feel like this report's going to give that type of response. But we're totally engaged. <laughs> you are. Just much more serious. Yeah. Um, so over the last couple months, I've shared information with you around school start times. Uh, the committee that uh, worked on that throughout the course of the school year. Uh, and then also how it related to transportation services. So I'm going to talk about that tonight and then also um, talk about some, some recommendations that uh, the committee has and uh, that administration is bringing before you. So um, when we look at just the work, this is some of the stuff you've seen before, but when we look at the work of the committee, uh, it was really uh, guided by the strategic plan and the goal to review school start and dismissal times and develop a plan to utilize and resources and maximize operational efficiency. And I think that's a really important uh, thing to keep in mind as we go through this, um, because it's, it's really key to, to the work and, and also to the recommendations. Uh, so the committee actually began its work uh, in September, and um, it was made up of 19 different uh, members, um, seven district administrators, six building administrators, and also uh, six staff members. Um, from all different uh, ranges. So uh, some were early childhood uh, teachers all the way up to uh, teachers in high school who were teaching uh, juniors and seniors. So um, a good representation, um, and they were uh, very committed and interested in the work. So early on, we divided into three subcommittees. Uh, you can see those committees there. Um, and um, the committees then worked independently, and we came back together um, in December. So um, what guided the work was uh, these different bullets and, and trying to just identify what the goal was, the key considerations, the questions that we needed to address. Uh, obviously, it was going to entail a lot of research and looking at what other districts did, uh, not only our neighbors, but also districts across the country. Um, we wanted to look at districts that looked like us, too. So we have uh, districts that we've used before when they did the middle school study and those same districts that we pulled uh, information from. Um, from there, we wanted to develop solutions, obviously, and, and come up with um, making sure we identified what the strengths were, what the weaknesses were, what opportunities were there, and then uh, what the threats were, um, and then consider each one of those things and how they impacted the staff and, and students and families. The common learnings, um, quite honestly, became troublesome for the committee because most of the solutions really negatively imp impacted the system. Um, and um, it impacted students and impacted families negatively and impacted staff. And, um, and a lot of the options just failed to present any type of efficiencies, uh, which obviously went in direct opposition to the goal. And so uh, when all three, it was interesting, when the three subcommittees kind of came back together and we looked at that matrix that we had talked about on how we were going to determine uh, solutions and recommendations, we all had a very, very similar approach, even though we'd worked independently. And a, 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 a kind of a conclusion was the existing problem around busing and our transportation services was really hindering any type of progress we could make um, when it came to changing start times, um, when it came to being more agile uh, with our system. And so, uh, but we needed to really address that, that busing situation. And I want to say there, and to kind of pause for a second, because um, the more I reflect on, on this busing situation is uh, the more I think about that although the situation, you know, is 
more dire now for Blue Valley and I think for um, school districts across the country. It was also an issue pre-pandemic. Um, it just wasn't as significant and it wasn't impacting and stressing the system so much. And quite honestly, in, in 22 years as a, a school administrator, I don't know if I've had as big a challenge um, in something that you're faced with like persistently and pervasively on a daily basis. Um, and, you, and it's and to the point where it's difficult to, to try to pivot and make some quick adjustments and figure it out. And so that, those are just a couple of things. And, and then the other one is um, we think about, you know, we get kind of talk about the complaints coming to district office and those types of things, but there's a daily stress that's been um, on our staff that I think has to be recognized here that, that you know, and I guess I'm, I'm, I personally do my best to try to protect them from those types of things because especially on the finance and operations end of the system, um, we want to do our best to make things run smoothly for them so that they can put their focus on their kids and student learning. And what's become very apparent is that uh, because of the situation, you know, kids are, are late to school and they're missing learning opportunities. And, um, and then they're late to get home and that disrupts the family um, on the back end when they're trying to get to other activities and have family time together. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the state of transportation and then also talk about what types of things Durham has done to try to address the, the issue and then what types of things we're trying to work with Durham um, in the future to, to address the issue also. So I'm going to turn that over to Jason uh, Gillum to talk about uh, some of those things. Thank you, Kyle. Good evening. Uh, the slide that you have before you kind of gives you the average of what we've been facing daily uh, this school year. Um, obviously, you can see from this slide we are short a number of routes, but I want to take it to today. I want to take it to what did, what did today look like? Uh, we had 11 vacant routes this morning, meaning routes that don't have a driver um, that Durham doesn't have employed. We had seven call in with the stomach flu, and we had three that were planned to be off. That means we started this morning at 5 o'clock with my phone blowing up with text um, of uh, all the uh, changes and, and uh, improvising that Durham was trying to do to, to get our kids to school. That meant we had 21 routes at both the middle school and high school level and the elementary level that we were having to either double up or circle back and uh, pick up and get to school late. We had a number of kids late to school today. It's not unique. We've been battling that the entire school year. And something needs to change. We, we need to do something um, significant and several things significant to help bring the improvement necessary to get these kids to school and get them home on a consistent basis. So that's, that's really what I wanted to share with you today about the state of, state of transportation. Although our average has been about 15, today it was 21. And we really felt that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what, what Durham's doing. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, thank you. Jason, what time do those kids get home? So 21 routes, what time was, I know we always, you always have like the last, we get a notice when everybody's off the bus. What yeah, time was so that? We, we tracked that uh, in terms of the last kid got delivered home today at 5.03. Okay. So, so you, back back in the day, was it, I don't know, 4.15, 4.30? Um, on a good day, we are probably about 4.40. Right now? If, if, if we had better staffing, we'd be about 440, but right now, right now we've been- The goal five. is an hour, okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So talking about some of the things that Durham is doing. So Durham um, is aggressively trying to recruit drivers. This is, they've been doing this all year. The corporate team has come and said, what, what can we do? Ask the local managers, what can we do to help support you? And um, they, they said we could use some money for bonuses. Um, They've been paying a $1,000 referral bonus paid to both um, individuals and entities. So they've, they've gone out to civic groups, churches, and said, hey, would you help us? Would you partner? This is a, this is a way to help your community. We'll pay you, entity, the, the $1,000 referral bonus if you help us find people. Um, they've offered sign-on bonuses for non-CDL drivers of so $1,500 and then $3,000 for CD, current CDL holders that come over and transfer over and stay um, with the district. Uh, corporate recruiting staff have been here um, um, several weeks this year helping our local recruiting team um, with best practices that they've seen across the country and how to 
uh, Canvas and, and help find uh, people. Um, and then they've also been providing ongoing weekly professional support for the local team, so kind of helping them get through the applicants. What we're finding is if you get an applicant, you have to get through it very, very quickly to get to them and before somebody else does. So that's, uh, that's, that's a focus. Lots of advertisements, um, jobs fairs, events, uh, neighborhood marketing. Um, we've actually found that this has been one of the most uh, productive um, approaches to finding drivers. Um, and when we say neighborhood marketing, we have bus drivers going home with yard signs they're putting in their yards saying, you want to drive a bus, call this number. We have drivers going door to door in their neighborhoods trying to get neighbors interested in, in driving a bus for Blue Valley. And you have to remember, 95% plus of our drivers don't live within Blue Valley. So these are all the surrounding communities. Uh, whether we go across the line in Missouri, we go north of the river, uh, we go all the way down to Osawatomi, bringing folks in to be bus drivers here for Blue Valley. Uh, businesses and organizations, uh, they, they've done a really nice job in reaching out to some of our local businesses and saying, how can we cross market, uh, whether it be a, a restaurant that's struggling with trying to find serving staff and saying, okay, why don't you be a bus driver and get a base pay and benefits and then you could be a, serving, a server at lunch because we don't need you at lunchtime and uh, partnerships that way. They've, they've had advertisements on pizza boxes that are being delivered home from Pizza Shuttle. If you've ordered Pizza Shuttle, you may have seen a, uh, a Durham bus driver ad right on top of the box. So creative, different, different ways. Uh, but we also found too, especially with the gas price, prices uh, spiking, um, a lot of the folks that drive buses living in those um, communities that are a distance away are finding that the cost of gas is a barrier to come to work here. So Durham is running uh, vans to Kansas City, Kansas, or uh, different parts south uh, to help bring in folks. So they have a park and ride program to get them to come here to work. And we've been we've done that for a number of years, but it's been especially when gas prices spike, we see a lot more people willing and wanting that uh, that service. Uh, and appreciation events, um, lots. We, we we talk a lot about culture and creating a work culture here in Blue Valley. Um, I, the principals all hear from me and I, uh, regularly. This, uh, I tell them, I remind them, uh, if you want to retain your bus drivers, they have to feel the love from the buildings as well as district office. So please uh, thank them. Please get to know them. If they have a, a challenge on the bus, uh, be there to support them because that'll cause them to want to stay. So we all have a part to play in, in keeping them. But appreciation events, uh, Durham has done many things. Uh, most recently, I've, they've had a, a funnel cake truck come out uh, after, after a route at the end of the week just to say thank you to all the drivers. Uh, they have done a lot of different uh, games and promotions and giveaways, and they're giving away a TV here pretty soon for attendance. Um, so just, just fun stuff to help try to keep the uh, work environment a place that they uh, want to be. And they tell their friends that might be doing like jobs elsewhere. Um, so, so what are we? What else are we doing with with Durham? Uh, we we did hire a um, independent uh, consultant that has worked with the district a number of years. Uh, they're nationally known, um, called Transpar. They they focus just on student transportation, and we brought them in. We had them review um, Durham's contract. We've had several sit down conversations with their executive team, and we we discussed um, potential solutions that they could bring to the table to help with this, this challenge that we have of being short on drivers. Um, it was very constructive. Um, we had uh, uh, several months of conversation and we came away with some key, uh, key things that we believe we can do to um, contractually improve, give them a better chance to succeed, and those are listed here. So we have um, increased wages is something that obviously we think will help. We don't think it's the uh, only way to solve the problem, um, but we think that there's some opportunity there. Uh, extra customer service staff. You know, our our, our patrons um, have been frustrated at times when they try to reach the bus company and they can't. The reason why they can't is that everybody that has a CDL that works in the office that could possibly drive a bus, guess where they're at? They're driving a bus. Um, so they've been understaffed in the office, so we've talked about that and we've talked about the importance of creating a couple customer service positions within the office that can't drive. Uh, just to help make sure we have a base there that's uh, able to keep up with the call volume. Uh, the use of more Type D buses, if you're not familiar with that term, um, you'll see uh, on the large buses, there's buses that have hoods and noses to them, and there's some that kind of have that flat, flat face. That flat face bus um, 
holds about 10 more students uh, on board than the Type C bus with the hood. Um, we're, we have a commitment to get us up to about 10 of those Type D buses in our fleet, which is important for the elementary school that maybe has a full bus and maybe a couple kids on a waiting list that we don't have another bus driver to add another route. We could swap out equipment now and, and put a bigger bus in that situation and serve them all. Um, technology improvements. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of drivers that have gone over and above and we are so appreciative of. I, I want to mention that because uh, these drivers, they take a lot of pride in the route that they choose. They get to bid on and choose and learn that route. And then we tell them, hey, sorry, we, we also have this other route. Can you go run this after you finish your route? Well, the technologies that Durham has today, um, our way to communicate with that driver is two options. Over the radio, somebody's telling them turn by turn where to go to go drive that route that we just asked them to go pick up. Or they are faxing over to the school to print out maps to run out to the bus driver to say, Here's your instructions. We need to, we need to advance that technology. Um, we, we pushed hard and they've come up with a tablet solution um, that, that the assignment can be sent straight to the bus with instructions and directions. We believe that'll help with retention um, and burnout. Um, and then Wi-Fi connected cameras. So we have uh, um, a camera system on the bus today, uh, but we park buses in five different locations in Blue Valley. So if a question comes up and we need to go get the information, somebody from Durham's office has to go out to one of the five locations where buses are parked, pull a hard drive, and bring it back to the office to search through a video. Too much effort is being made to kind of help solve those questions when they come up, and they come up on a daily basis. So um, those are some of the uh, additional efforts that we're working on through a contract modification. Um, and we've, uh, with Transpar's help, we, when, when analyzing the contract, we have uh, a max age of a bus of 12 years in our contract and an average age of about 6.1 or 2. Um, and looking at the next couple years, there's no buses that have to be replaced. So we want to take advantage of uh, a couple years of uh, not having to replace buses to be able to afford some of these key improvements uh, that are necessary. So. Um, that's the contract modification that we've been talking about and Transpar's recommending that we, we act upon. So we'll, we'll be back next month with that. Pat? Uh, so it, as Jason noted, um, even with all these different efforts, uh, we still believe there's going to be a, a gap for us to fill um, in trying to you know overcome uh, the deficits we're in now. But um, step one that the committee really identified as, as a positive measure that um, was really kind of a minor tweak to some schedules. Um, high school start time uh, would remain the same, um, but the school day would end 10 minutes earlier, and um, uh, they've just identified some places where they could do that. It wasn't actually what a year or two ago before they just extended it 10 minutes, so I think they're just retreating from that. But um, uh, middle school would be 10 minutes later. They're currently at 741 start. And elementary would be a five-minute uh, switch from 8:35 to 8:40. Uh, the idea behind that is by uh, staggering high school and middle school by that 10-minute or 11-minute time, it would allow for some more combination routes. We already do those combination routes, but it maximizes our opportunity to do that. To do that, um, and then the other thing is is one of the one of the factors we have to keep in place is, is maintaining this 45-minute window between. I call this tier one, which would be dropping our middle school kids off and then going that back out, the same bus drivers going back out, get the elementary kiddos and get them to school on time. And then the same result with when it comes to um, getting them home. Um, this results in an estimated reduction of five to six routes. Um, next thing I want to talk about is, is what state statute is versus board policy and then uh, Blue Valley's practice. So um, the state statute says that um, you're required to transport students who live 2.5 miles or above uh, from their school, and it's the most direct route um, is how that's identified, and we receive funding uh, for that. Um, the Blue Valley practice is not only adhering to the statute, of course, but it's also uh, providing a pay rider service uh, to uh, families who want to take advantage of that um, if they are don't qualify under uh, the statute. So um, the next step we believe that we need to do to position ourselves for success 
beyond just that schedule change, beyond the recommendations from Transpar, is reducing this pay rider option. Um, so the recommendation that, that really the, the committee res wrestled with on this was, um, you know, we know that the change in start times is not enough. We know that these contract improvements um, should help, but probably won't dig us out of the hole. How far can we go uh, with a recommendation or need to go um, to make sure that we're going to set ourselves up for success and make sure that kids don't continue to lose instructional time? And this was the recommendation that um, appeared, which was um, removing the pay rider service for high school and middle school students who are less than 1.5 miles unless they're qualifying for special education transportation services. Right now, it's estimated that that's about 515 students who would lose um, transportation. Um, should note there that there's approximately uh, 1,250 students who uh, have their transportation services probably interrupted on a daily basis. So there, there's that many students who are being negatively impacted, typically. And we also have a total of 6,000 riders. So beyond just our pay rider system, uh, the total number of riders is that. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of, of what we're talking about here as far as total numbers of students impacted. But this gets a reduction of, of nine to 10 routes, um, <coughs> which when you start to think about what we were talking about earlier, when we have an average of 15 but could see spikes of 20, 21, um, this puts us in a closer position at least to be successful day to day. Um, the other thing that uh, typically this, you'd see this on, on the consent agenda would be the adjustments to pay rider fees. We didn't put that on there intentionally. We wanted to embed it in this presentation because it just made sense to talk about this holistically and, and have this as another uh, recommendation in motion. So um, it, it's, a, it's a minor change, as you can see here, um, but it primarily has to do with um, um, changing it according to when pay riders um, sign up early, right? Um, so as it states there, a super majority of pay riders try to register by their early pay deadline. So um, this would, you know, impact them just slightly. Yeah, so, um, you know, bus stop distances are, are typically don't go over 0.25 miles. Um, one of the things that would help, um, once again, speed up routes is a reduction in um, the number of stops, which would then, by increasing um, that's from 2.5 or 0.25 to 0.5, um, where it's safe to do so, then that helps with obviously the efficiency of running those bus routes. So even if the bus went by your house, I know that that's always you know the question. The bus goes by and your kiddo gets to jog down the street. No, hopefully your kiddo's already ready and waiting for the bus. Um, but uh, there's no. Because I think, I think in the past, what I've heard, we've been a little flexible on that. Um, so that would be pretty solid. Even though your bus is going by your house, you got to be at the stop. Yeah, that would be correct. Yeah. And that would be my son. That would be one of those that would be running half a mile to do that. Yeah. Uh, so that the pay rider fees, um, last slide is just uh, discussion questions uh, that you may have that I know we had discussion this morning board workshop, but any uh, extension of that. Any questions? Well, I know we had, we had talked about this quite a bit this morning, just for, for those in the audience. Um, and, and one of my concerns um, was that there were no parents, you know, on your committees. And um, so I just, I'm, you know, I, I gave you the question this morning, and um, um, just just a seat at the table. Even though you know, I think the more parents that know what we're confronted with um, could help in 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 knowing what options are available. Yeah, I I thought more about that a little bit. Um, there were a number of parents because they were either they were staff members in some cases, so. Some of the teachers uh, had students, some of our principals have students that will be impacted by this, quite honestly, um, and same with district office staff. So uh, there are some folks, um, 
I also failed to mention, and you heard it in my Finance and Operations Advisory Committee report, that it was discussed with that group, too. Um, there was good conversation around that and, and decent feedback. Um, but um, um, by and large, it was the, the response was, this is not fun. This is not you know, something we believe that it, you know, nobody wants to do. Um, but there was an understanding that uh, they understood the recommendation and why it was there. But point taken. Yeah, Kyle, what's our what's our turnover, and do we do we track that kind of a turnover rate? Yeah. So the attrition rate uh, for bus drivers in a typical year is about twenty five percent. So that means we, we have to be churning a lot of new bus drivers through the system on a regular basis. And it takes quite a bit of time to get them all the way through um, from the applicant stage, through all the background checks, physicals, uh, classroom training, behind the wheel training, <coughs> testing, uh, before they can become a, a bus driver. So we're constantly, there hasn't been a meeting yet this year that we haven't talked about. We refer to it as the pipeline. How many people do we have in the pipeline and what stage they're at because of the attrition. Okay. And then maybe, uh, a following question: What's the what's the current rate that uh, we're paying or Dur through through Durham? Uh, the the current starting rate is right about uh, eighteen dollars an hour, just under. That's the starting pay. And that's not for utilization. That's not for using their buses. We provide our buses, and we just pay an hourly rate. Uh, no, it's their it's their buses. It's their buses. Yes. We contract them, so so we rent their buses, basically. Or I know we've got a lot of buses parked. Yeah, it's, they, they they own the buses. Okay. Uh, there's there's a lease component to it, but okay. yes. So the contract includes the leasing of the buses right. and the, the services. The buses. Overall contract, contract pays for it all. Mm -hmm. the, just so I'm clear, that that rate, eighteen dollars an hour, is what the bus driver receives. We pay probably some markup on that, or uh, we don't pay uh, based on uh, employee hours. We pay based on routes performed. But it average, I'm just trying to understand kind of what does it mean to the driver? 18 bucks an hour gross is kind of at the starting rate? Correct, starting rate. Average driver probably in the low to mid 20s. Okay. Based and, on seniority. and Durham has other schools in the Kansas City metro area, so my guess is that they pay, they have a pay yeah. structure for all schools that they service. Correct. It is, it is a negotiated agreement uh, with the Teamsters uh, Union, so it had been for ever since uh, several decades ago. So. so our overall contract pays for everything, right? It's a lump contract, pays for it all. Whatever the salary is, it falls into their agreed-upon contract. And Correct. also that could change through future negotiations we may have and other Correct. things. Correct. Okay. Absolutely. And I know, that, I know it's been a tough time. And so again, this does not affect elementary schools, right? Correct. We, or or we, not affect, but your plan it is yeah. not it will positively impact elementary schools because the elementary schools right now are being negatively impacted by not having enough drivers to cover all the routes, but if we reduce the routes, um, they will be made whole, whole again and, and uh, begin the school on time. Okay, so elementary is taken care of. Remind me of the neighboring district. Does everybody provide buses to element for elementary schools? Just that it it's it's been a it's been a change. Uh, we're not the first to make a change like this. Uh, so we we've, we've uh, looked around at some of our neighbors. I know in Olathe today, um, <coughs> if you reside less than a mile from home to elementary school, there's no transportation services provided. If you are in Olathe and you're a middle school or high school student and you're less than one and a half miles, there's no transportation option provided. Um, Shawnee Mission does it a little bit different. They look at it by boundary area and make decisions in some of their schools. They say there's no buses at all for the school um, just because of everybody's within two and a half miles that, that goes to that school. Um, Lawrence is probably another, another good example to give uh, where they say, okay, the, the state rule is two and a half miles. We're not providing any transportation under two and a half miles. So, so have we ever told anyone no? <laughs> we don't like to tell people no. Uh, I, I know we don't. I yeah. just I'm curious. I, you know. Um, in, in what way? Do you ever put a, a threshold? You get your buses all set. You get your routes all set. Okay. And then, you know. Yeah. So we we have uh, late ads. Um, so we have deadlines to sign up to register for the bus. So uh, we we may tell them that if you signed up three days before school starts and the routes have already been established, and to add you would change the times for every other family on that route. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that for the first day of school, but we will be able to uh, by Labor Day. 
But if they're two and a half miles or more, we don't have a choice, Jody. Yeah, right. we, ha we have to add them. We have to add them. Right. So we have to have time to, to work them in, but we do have to add them with three But, but we treat the two and a half mile families as well as within that circle the same and, and, oh, and yeah. work it in. Right, right now, I mean, some of the most difficult conversations I have with parents is when they, they call and they, they are the ones that are uh, being late picked up in the morning or late drop, uh, dropped off at home and they're beyond two and a half miles and they're asking, why aren't we prioritized over pay riders that you're not required to, drive, to take to school? And I don't have a great answer for that right now. So that, that, that question that comes up, that's come up by several parents. Do you have something else, Tom or Jody? No, I'll chat in later on just overall. Jason, appreciate you working on this. Did did um, we didn't have a lot of parent involvement, but we had some. Did we were we able to identify reasonable options for those 515 kids, or is it just kind of one of those situations where? I think the most important thing that uh, we could do is to let them know with, a, with as much advance warning as possible that a change is coming. So that way they can begin making, making other plans and arrangements. Uh, it, could be, it could be something as they have, a, they have a lease coming due this summer that they may want to think about. Maybe we don't want to stay in the same, uh, same uh, house that we're renting and we want to move some, somewhere else. Uh, they would have the opportunity to, to, to make that family decision or to find a carpool with their neighbors or other ways to solve it. Part of the communication plan um, this month, I plan to communicate uh, with the PTA PTO presidents group, um, really walk through this present presentation with them and and help them understand. Because I, I think our our parent groups within our schools could offer some support or uh, maybe um, uh, create you know some type of different systems that would would help. I have two questions, um, if I can remember them both. Um, the one is, did you run it? Um, just with without high school students, um, because you know, at some point they drive, right? Right. Potentially. Yeah. So we haven't been able to to complete that, Jody. But I would say that it, it, the initial uh, look at it is that it would not give us the same number of route savings as what we have recommended. Half. Ish. I, I don't. I wouldn't hold you to anything. I'm just. Yeah. I'd, I'd probably say at least a third or forty percent less. So three or four less than what we're what we're looking at, at least. So it was nine or ten, I believe it stated right. So this would save you five, right? Five, maybe. Mm -hmm. Just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. so when you when you look at the number of kids who are riding, the younger kids ride more than the middle school age kids, than the high school age kids. So the less the least participation we have is going to be at the high school level. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and especially after school at least from what I found, because that's when a lot of activities take place. And mornings, you know, not so much, so. Uh, Jason, I want to appreciate the <coughs> committee's work and, and all of the iterations that you work through. I know it's complicated, and I don't think this is an easy issue um, to work through, but uh, appreciate all that hard work. Thank you. I know what I was going to ask, secondly. Um, so is this, I mean, we, we know that, that all across the country, staffing shortages, you know, is, is an issue, or are an issue. Um, but is this about, I mean, we're constantly talking about funding, right? Mm -hmm. Is this fallout in some way from the funding issue? Um, I, I'll say this. Um, at the state level, they've had conversations around um, funding transportation differently and saying, you know, is, is two and a half miles too far? Should it be one and a half? And, um, and even in conversation today with Katie, we talked about Missouri is a, is a one and a half mile rule. So, um, so they received funding for that and, and transportation is required for students 1.5 miles and over. So um, we, we believe like with this adjustment that we would stay within you know, those type of guidelines and parameters and, and um, um, at least what, across the state line and in, and in the same as conversations at the state level. But I do not see them changing that 2.5 mile rule though. Is your point that or is it, let's just say we got special education funded and we had a certain amount of money to make up for some of those. We, we'd have more money in our overall budget, thus could essentially pay our bus service more money in the contract and pay the drivers more. Is that what you're getting yeah. at? 
Is the, is the pay riders um, aspect of the program pay for itself? It, it does not. Uh, so it is actually subsidized. Uh, so secondary benefits, uh, reducing the routes is a, a slight budgetary savings that we could then turn around as we're doing the contract modifications, look at putting towards um, paying bus drivers more. And, and so is it, does it not pay for itself because to do so would just make it um, a price point that doesn't make sense? It'd be a price point that would stick out when compared to our peers in the, in the area. And we just have never stepped out in that way. And as a reminder, this would not affect elementary, this would not affect anybody 2.5 miles or more, and it would not affect students whose IEP, their special education students and their IEP calls for transportation. So we're legally obligated to provide uh, 2.5 and more, and we're legally obligated to provide anything that's uh, in an IEP, and we would, con that would not, we would not touch those. Correct. It'd be, it'd be positively impacted. You know, the bus topic's been a topic since I came on this board 10 years. I don't know if you remember, Jason, remember we switched users and we had that awful first couple months when they came on board. I hate to say the word awful, but it was just, just new and getting things fixed. And I, I think it's always been kind of a struggle, right, with, with staffing, getting enough folks, the routes and those type of things. Now it's only just enhanced. Correct. Through everything going on. And it's unfortunate for a lot of our families that are counting on this And as it's well. a conversation on every superintendent call I do, whether it's in the state or across the country. Yeah, and there's conferences with the topic and everything like that. I, I, you know, my overall thoughts on this, I, I'd like to, I've written down some notes here and just recap. So you've got an average of 15 vacant routes a day. 15. You had 21 today. You have kids that are consistently late to school or late getting home or to, you know, other things after school. Um, we have no sign of getting it better, or it's getting better, right? Are we seeing any positives at all? You get the price of gas we're throwing in here as well with getting these drivers here. Um, hearing this plan and seeing it, and obviously we saw it this morning as well, or in last few questions, I, I just, I'm just wondering if this makes us better overall, especially with planning and overall efficiency, if you will. And I know it's going to be painful for, for some families, but I'm just wondering if the end game here with just the ability to know folks to plan, you guys to be able to do some things that you haven't been able to do for a while that just makes us overall efficient and, and things actually get better. So we know routes are gonna be filled and kids are no longer late to school and kids are no longer late getting home and you're no longer getting 20 texts at 5.30 p.m. and, and no longer is Dr. Merrigan worried that kids aren't home yet because I know she worries about it. She, I think you always ask for a note, when's the last kid to get off the bus, which is awesome. So to me it seems reasonable that we, we have to make some tough choices and have to make some changes and hopefully maybe it's it's a six month change or maybe it's a year or two and we we can revisit this but i think the plan you put forward just knowing um is is, is could be a good one at the at the end of the day those are my overall thoughts any other comments or questions so 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 you're asking us to approve the pay rider fees? I thought there were a couple pieces here. Yeah, so there's there's two uh, recommendations in most motions. One is to approve the pay rider fees uh, that we presented and also uh, to approve the recommendation um, that we presented to eliminate the pay rider ship for middle school and high school students, uh, except for those under 1.5 miles, except for those who qualify for SPED, uh, SPED transportation services. Um, and that would be it. Now there should be two different motions that are listed on there. You know. so, the, I, just one comment, which I, I, I said some things this morning, which I, I hold to, but uh, um, I don't want to reiterate them all. Um, I, I don't think there's no, I don't think there's any easy choices here. Um, but I, I feel like we are in the service business at some point in time, some prior board decided the you know the the um, this one and a half mile rule for pay riders and there's a lot of people that have settled expectations on it and I hate making decisions when the, the market's not like it's it's at it, its worst and so I I just sense that, that we're at the you know at the, at the like app, could things get worse yes it could get you know Gas could go up higher. 
the unemployment rate could go lower, wages could go higher, and I don't know, you know, and there's a tax on rubber or something that makes, you know, you know the, things could get worse, but um, that's, my sense is that, that, that I, I hate to, to see a service business cut a something that, you know, not an insubstantial number of people um, rely on at, at a point where, you know, we're at our most stressed. But I, I don't think it's a great answer to tell you, well, you know, let's you know, throw more money at it or whatever. But that, that's kind of where I am. Yeah, I think this is a difficult issue under the circumstances, and it's, it's one of many that we continue to be faced with. Um, I also wonder if, um, you know, things will get better or there's uh, other ways to, to make this work. But uh. So, Patrick, just a thought here. One, I think, and I could be wrong, but that at a minimum we could approve the pay rider fees for tonight. I don't know that anyone's – that I think we, we understand and – generally believe that it's time to pass some of that on. Um, so maybe we do that first. Um, and just for a couple of folks that have mentioned um, not getting parental feedback, I'm just trying to process what, and, and, I, and I follow what Kyle said as well, which is there were parents on that committee. So it wasn't like it was just no parents. But is it giving them more notice or is it, hearing of some idea that they might have that hasn't been thought of. I'm just trying to get my head around, because I, I think from the, what both Jason and Kyle have talked about from a parental planning perspective, sooner than later to be able to tell folks that this is in effect is important. Um, but hypothetically, what would one month buy us? Um, and I'm just thinking out loud a little bit just to make sure that I'm thinking about what you guys are thinking about. And uh, like Kyle said, he's going to PTA, PTO here pretty quick. So what what do you guys think? You're wondering whether that buys us a little more thought into this or if perhaps it doesn't do anything. Or number two is, is it better off to give folks a little more heads up? Yeah, I'm just trying to balance month. that in my head. Plus Ex our administrative team to plan this out with our bus service and other things. Is right. that what you're pondering? And I would say I don't think going past the May board meeting – no is an option for sure and these two would probably say going past this board meeting is probably not a great option but yeah i think we're all in 100 percent agreement this, these are tough decisions here right i don't disagree with anything. I, I agree with jim's just thoughts are 100 percent on t doing stuff like this and not knowing exactly what's going to happen i'm just trying to give it a little more re realistic approach that we know this is a problem we, we're going to have to pivot a little bit somewhere somehow maybe this isn't the perfect answer but i just i think we got to figure out something so to me, the biggest thing that I took away from tonight versus earlier today is that it's 1,250 kids impacted daily um, by their routes and making them late to school or late home. And this is gonna impact 500, um, which is obviously we don't wanna impact any, but with, with no change in the foreseeable future on number of kids impacted daily, this seems like a great option in contrast. I think too, when we're speaking from a point of trying to get back to normal, everybody's trying to get back to normal. And if you're looking at 1200 kids every day, um, I can see the look on their faces when they're presenting this, they don't like it. Nobody does, um, but I do agree with Jim. It's not just giving my two cents, but when uh, we're looking at every kid having to deal with that every day. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of worried parents. I would be very distraught if my littles were on the bus till almost 5 p.m. I can tell you that right now. I do not like the fact that we're going to impact 500, but I can't even imagine what, like Kyle, what you said, you're trying to protect all the admin from the angry texts and phone calls and stuff. I mean, we've had trouble with buses before, and there are times... Um, where they're hesitant to tell you where they're at, we're not sure. So that is scary as well. So, is that uh, 1,200 kids? Is that majority of them elementary kids that are showing up at five, or is it middle school, or is it high school? 1,250 kids a day is all grade levels. That's how many buses. Right, but it's so. So is it 1,250 that are showing up late? 
could be an assortment of things. Correct. Anywhere from 30 to 60. Correct. Anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes late getting to school or late getting home from when they are expected to. We bus about 6,000, right? So um, I, I'm probably in the minority, but I am of the view that money is mostly the thing that makes, you know, in a market economy, it's what generally drives decisions. Um, and I was just trying to do some math and to make sure I'm not, my math isn't way off, that if you just across the board did like a $5, your starting pay was not 18, but 23, and moved everybody up to 28, and just, just thought exercise. Not proposing it. I'm just mm -hmm. um, and pretend that there was like no other mon monetary issues that we were faced in the district. Mm -hmm. um, any, any, I, you know, any, or and what if it was seven dollars an hour? And what, what, but I kind of calculated that to be kind of a five to six hundred thousand dollar cost to go five bucks an hour. Is that close? I think you're a little bit left. Okay. Like yeah, $500,000 lower or like $200,000 lower? Uh, the numbers that we were looking at to make a, a, a significant move like that would be in the seven figures. Okay. Hey, just I got one more quick question. I'm not sure what, what, how beneficial this is, but do we have performance measures in the contract? We do. We actually have an SLA in the contract. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously uh, uh, Durham is not fully uh, um, staffed to perform all the routes that we're requiring and that is a measurement in the contract so they are providing a liquidated damage to the district on a monthly basis um, based on that and it is I will tell you it's substantial um, and it's one that uh, um, they, they feel they feel a lot of pain from it from a bottom line of when they look at this business operating uh, providing service to Blue Valley um, they are upside down can you also just talk for a minute about other options in town? I mean, I know Tom touched sure. on early in his tenure on the board. I think you said it sounded like we switched companies. Yeah, yeah we switched companies. I think these guys are doing a great job since then. It just, you know, new buses coming in, mm -hmm. drivers filling out the routes, their administrators figuring out it was, it was a tough, it, two yeah, months yeah, the long. Was probably, right? The first several weeks was yeah. a tough one. Okay. Whatever you're I'm just kind of curious, and, and I know you guys have thought through everything mm -hmm. under the sun, but yeah. I don't get the impression that other com bus companies in town are not feeling the same pressure. Uh, none of them have any surplus uh, buses or drivers to offer us to help our shortage because there are, many of them are either just barely making it or short themselves. I've, we, I've talked to a number of bus operators um, in, in the metro area and that's been the consistent story. But changing providers doesn't necessarily solve this problem either? No, no well, we experienced, uh, so we, we uh, those of you that re remember, we had uh, first student as a vendor for a number of years, and uh, we went through an extensive RFP process, took a year and a half, two years going through the process and managing the change. Uh, we hired a company called Peterman, um, and what we quickly found out is that what we really bought was a different philosophy and a different leadership, but when it came to the staff, we're still pulling from the same community. So the staff mostly just changed over with with the company and there wasn't a huge influx of new new drivers quick question so um, this has obviously been an issue for many many years we've talked about that right so by by accepting these recommendations cutting the routes down uh, 15 <coughs> um, what what makes us think that it's going to be better because there's, we've always worked at a deficit. Am I am I wrong on that? I mean, it, yeah, it, it feels like uh, with the with the bell time changes, with the pay ride uh, change that's that's recommended, with the contract modifications that we're that we're working towards, all of those things collectively, along with the uh, efforts that Durham is continuing to uh, to make on the recruitment standpoint, it, it gives us a chance to succeed. Because right now we're we're losing every day. Um, and it is, uh, it is a defeating feeling for our leadership team at Durham. Um, uh, I worry about their burnout on a, on a regular basis because I see the uh, number of hours that they're putting in to try to keep the ship afloat on a daily basis. That can't be sustained. We have to do something to, to help, um, otherwise it's gonna fall apart. Do you say how many pay riders are there total, including elementary? 
Uh, currently about 3,000, maybe just under. And I'm, I'm sorry, what was the increase we're going to approve or that you're recommending? Uh, $20. So what if we increased it $120? Well, how much money would that bring in? Uh, $20 is generating roughly $30,000. Oh, okay. So we're, we're, not, we're not talking huge dollars. What if we were increased it to $200? Yeah. Would people pay it? I, I think we'd hear from a lot of families that would struggle with that. Yeah, there's some that could and would. Yeah. Elementary. Again, my assumption is we'll stay on top of this, right? Let's say we've, we've made these motions, we approve this. I assume, Kyle and Jason, that this is a priority. We can revisit this. Things get better. We we could pivot, adapt, and go back to the providing a service that a lot of people had had in the past. And and we've provided a lot for people, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I I, I think that um, Durham is very motivated. J Jason kind of spoke to this. I I've been in I don't know how many meetings the last three years with with Durham management, like senior management making trips to to Blue Valley. Um, their account is important to us or important to them, um, and that relationship is actually um, pretty strong, especially since over the course of the school year when we really started to dig in and work on, okay, what can we do contractually to flip this thing around? And um, so there's a lot of positive momentum with Durham right now, I think, and with the recommendations we brought and with um, the contract, the renewed contract that were the amended contract that we would uh, bring to you next month. Um, that's quite on it. It's built around this recommendation. And we would be coming to you with a recommendation to go a different direction if we were hearing from our colleagues that it was so much better transportation wise we're not hearing that so ev I mean, l literally I don't know anybody who um, works in a school setting like us at an administrative level who would tell you oh my gosh busing haven't heard a word yeah Perfect. overall business might have to be reinvented a oh, little bit yeah it's a str it is a What's struggle coming? we get an email and and Jason has taken the brunt of this, um, but we, we got one today uh, with a strong concern, um, rightfully so, <laughs> because the bus was once again late 30 minutes. And um, she was very frustrated, it was a mother. Again, it, it, rightfully so. Um, she sat at home and waited for 30 minutes with her elementary aged kids. Mr. President, are you ready for a motion? Yeah, let's, let's have anybody ready, gonna be ready to make a motion. There's two motions. I have two motions. I'll do the um, rider fees first. I move that the Board of Education approves transportation pay rider fees for the 2022-2023 school year as presented. Is there a second? A uh, motion by Tom, uh, second by Gina. Any uh, additional discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. I move that the Board of Education approves the recommendation to no longer provide pay rider transportation services to high school and middle school students who reside less than 1.5 miles from school with the exception of students qualifying for special education transportation services. Tom's made a motion, is there a second? I'll second. Motion by Tom, second by Amy. Any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. Um, all opposed, same sign. Um, any abstentions? So motion passes four to one. Okay, the next item is uh, agenda or legislative update. Okay, um, this is a legislative update. We said we would do this each month that the, they are in session in Topeka and this is the legislative calendar. I highlighted in red right now, um, our legislators are on a break. Um, so 
April 2nd through the 24th. Uh, they are back in their districts and on a break. Um, and the veto session will begin on April 25th. Um, so again, just as a quick reminder, these are our board adopted priorities. Um, fund special education at the statutory amount of 92%. Apply at-risk funding to define student measures, enhance student mental health, and eliminate tax credits and vouchers for private schools. So first of all, I want to uh, extend our thanks, or my thanks, to uh, those in Topeka, because I know they have um, hard decisions to make, just like, like you all do. They are elected officials. And so they have done a number of different things. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of areas um, and to kind of tell you where they're at right now in Topeka. And I tried to look to, to see if the governor had signed any, anything into law, and I don't see, think she did today that affected us, per se. Um, so first of all, uh, the budget bill. So the budget bill uh, currently is CCR, committee, uh, Combined Committee Report um, for House Bill 2567. This did not, solve, this did not pass. So um, they had a House bill and they had a Senate bill and they weren't the same. So you have a conference committee come together um, and work and they did not solve that during the veto session. So they'll need the conference committee to iron out a common bill and they'll take it up in the veto session. Um, but in this bill, uh, special education is not slated to be at the statutory amount of 92%. And I just want to talk a little bit about how that affects Blue Valley. So if you look at the last two years, in 1920 and in 2020-21, uh, uh, you will see that we were covered at 62.2% two years ago, and last year it was at 65.3%. What that means is that Blue Valley's general fund um, had to absorb the rest of the cost. And so you can see the amount that that costs our, our district. Um, I just want to be really clear that that doesn't mean that we are not serving special education students. Because special education students have what's called an individual education plan, an IEP. Every single student who has an IEP has a team that comes together on a yearly basis and writes that IEP. And that team is, consists of parents, it consists of an administrator, it consists of a general education teacher, it consists of a special education teacher minimally. It could have other people on there as needed. They identify what that student needs. Never once, I've sat on a lot of IEP teams, never once did we have a discussion to say, I wonder if we can afford that. This student needs a full-time para. Oh, I wonder if we can afford that. We didn't even say, I wonder if we can hire one, because we are just concentrating on what that student needs. That student needs bus service. We can't, at, we can't call Jason and say, hey, do you think we're going to be able to get a bus? If that student needs it, we are obligated to provide it. So we are, that's what we're covering uh, when I say the Blue Valley cost of two years ago, 11.6 million, uh, last year about 9.7 million. So um, you may have noticed uh, that, or you may have heard that the Johnson County superintendents uh, wrote a letter to Governor Kelly and asked her uh, to amend her budget and to uh, include that we cover statutorily uh, special education. The reason what we did that is that the state has a surplus this year, and it is the, the time we believe that they, they actually could fund us at the statutory amount. So any questions on that before I move on? Can, um, can just, you just on that 9.7 million, mm -hmm. trying to, to do, that is the delta between 65.3 and 92%. Correct. And just to be clear that that money is spent and it comes from the general fund. Correct. And, and, then, and then the other 8% comes from the general fund as well. Correct, always. Okay. Yeah. And so if we got the additional special ed funding, that would therefore be additional money in, in the, the general, general fund. fund. Correct. Okay. And so, so this is not for, so this is for 22-23? No, this no. is for 1920 and 2021. It's for the last two years because 20, we're not done with this year yet. You're saying the governor's budget. Right. Oh, the governor's budget is um, going forward, yes. That is correct. 2022-23, 20, mm -hmm. right. And so for, for that budget year, we would need how much? I, I don't know. Um, around between 9 and 11 million. 
And so, so that would be based on what we would expect in terms of enrollment that would... It would, based on, again, those IEP needs, right. um, what we identify, if we have additional students move in, um, if we identify that different students need different services, um, we have to hire more speech language pathologists, more OTs. Um, so it's a big unknown in terms of correct. What actually facing, correct. and it fluctuates from year to year depending correct. on which kids move in and out. Yep. And, and there is fluctuation, mm -hmm. right? So I know you're going to talk about the open mm -hmm. borders mm -hmm. probably next, um, but one of the big implications of open borders, I believe, is that you know we serve everyone so we wouldn't know when we accept a student if they have special needs, right? So there, there could yeah. be increased special needs costs as a result of the open borders legislation, right? Well, my understanding is um, that that is that they have said that's not something we could ask. Like we could put some criteria absolutely in place, but that we couldn't ask, do you have an IEP? Um, we would have to base every student on the availability of space and whatever our policy was around that is the way I currently understand that. And, and there's a, a bill before the legislature about transfer, right? Yeah, we're going to get to that. Okay. Just hold on. Good, good question. Oh, look at that. Open enrollment. Um, mandated open enrollment uh, is now included in that budget bill that we just talked about that is not uh, fully um, done yet, but it was Senate Bill 455 and House Bill 2016, no conference committee bill. They just put it into the budget bill. Um, so again, our concerns around this are Blue Valley resources being used by non-Blue Valley taxpaying residents, the administrative time and money to staff the program, and the logistics of saving enough space for Blue Valley residents who move in throughout the year. So you know, if a student moves in today, I bet in one of our schools, uh, somebody showed up today because they had just moved here. And we, we, if they're within our boundaries, we have to take those students. And so we'd want to make sure we left room in our schools for those students. Uh, the other thing is, is we would not be able, and we wouldn't want to discriminate uh, against any students. So we'd have to be careful what we ask if they're outside of our borders before we uh, allow them to enroll. <laughs> So again, this is not a separate bill. This is currently embedded into the budget bill that will have to be settled in the veto session. Um, the Parent Bill of Rights uh, Conference Committee uh, report for Senate Bill 58. Um, so this bill uh, was passed, and it clarifies that all parents have the right uh, to direct the upbringing, education, care, and mental health of their child. Um, it would require local school boards to develop and adopt policies uh, to guarantee that those rights are reserved by the state for parents with regard to their child. So that, that's what it says. Um, again, we support and encourage parent involvement. Absolutely. Um, parents have a right to see anything used in the classroom. I, we would absolutely agree with that. You know, I thought back as I was thinking about this uh, 23 years ago when I started as a counselor at Blue Valley High School, one of the first parent meetings I had was with a parent who had some concerns about her health curriculum. And so I got to know the health teacher really, eat, really quickly, and we sat down with that parent and walked through the health curriculum and through the materials that were used. Um, and that parent chose to opt their child out of a certain section of it. Uh, and that was allowed, and that still would be allowed today. Uh, we, we want to protect our teachers in this. Um, we don't want to hinder a teacher's ability to adapt mid-year to a student's needs. Um, we also want to ensure that this doesn't add additional work to our teaching staff. So for me, the, what I have been saying is the devil's in the details on this. Um, I, if we can do this from a district level, I, I don't want to add extra work to anybody here either, um, but I certainly wouldn't want to add work to the teachers uh, within our buildings. And that one did pass, and I believe it's um, on the governor's desk at this point. Yeah, I don't know. That's why I was, I was looking to see if anything had gotten signed today. I don't think it did. But she has uh, 10 days, right? Yeah, 10 days. Uh, to either sign it, uh, veto it, or if she doesn't sign it, it becomes law. So the, so the open enrollment bill is still being jockeyed, or that's, it's final, finalized? 
No, it's it's still being. There is no final. Uh, it is in the that uh, budget. This one. Oh, yeah. okay. It's included in that budget bill. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff that's included in that bill now. Okay. That has to be settled in the veto session. So I was I mentioned earlier that there was in that on that open enrollment bill that Mark was like did this listening session. I thought it was really well done in this special mm -hmm. ed advisory council. And there were a couple of points. Uh, again, this was like a total across the board spectrum of different perspectives. Um, Mark made an interesting point, but I'm wondering, I don't you know, I, we can't do anything about it, but it's it's at least interesting to understand that a lot of districts, like vast majority of Kansas, Kansas districts, already have open enrollment. There are several districts that do already allow it. And they probably use it as a, as a mechanism to attract students. Yep. So it's a, it becomes a revenue source for them. Right. The concern, in Blue Valley is it's unknown as to whether or not um, it be, you know, we, we probably would get and, and, you know, ask, you know, people that want to come to the district. Um, and that could be financially beneficial or it could be financially detrimental, particularly if it impacts special education services. Correct. So there's some unknowns there. Mm -hmm. So those were points that, that uh, some people made. Um, there was a little bit of discussion of, around how the, how this would be would become a burden <coughs> on Blue Valley taxpayers if the students coming are bringing fin basically the financing follows mm -hmm. those students, but I. The way I answered, the, Mark asked me to answer that. I said, beyond the special ed versus general ed um, issue, that it it could be based on the way the capital budgets are mm -hmm. financed. So maybe you could address that, Jeff. Right. So um, residents are the ones who finance our bonds. Uh, residents are the ones who um, uh, correct give us the capital outlay resources to maintain our buildings. Um, so that those would the base state aid would come from if if they're here by September twentieth, right. I might add. Right. Uh, if they're here by September twentieth, the base state aid would come from the state. That and is how, correct. And how much is the base state aid? Uh, forty-seven ish. Forty-seven hundred. Yeah, forty-seven hundred, forty-eight hundred, um, is the base state aid for. So that's all that would come. For, for one student. And then if there were any waitings, so if they were in special education, we might get some waitings there, but we know it's not at 100%. We know that um, we have to pay the excess. Um, <laughs> if they're career technical education, waitings. If they're in special education, um, I believe we would have to require, we would have to pay for transportation if the IEP team deemed that they needed transportation. Okay. So, so that, those were all the points that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, at least I wanted to highlight. Yep that um, came out of it. So, you know, um, but but by and large, the sentiment was like, almost across from conservative, liberal, non-political, et cetera, that weren't really in favor of this. And that the other thing is, is that like, we're aware of it, but you know, maybe most of the patrons in the right. district aren't. They're not. And can you, I, I, I'm afraid if this went through the aftermath or folks kind of cluing into what was going on would be tremendous, especially especially everything you're talking about. And then you start tying in athletics and activities and recruiting. And here, you know, here comes your child. They're going to be a senior somewhere and great expectations. And here comes 10 kids to to jump in that are not part of the district and et cetera and things like that. So the aftermath of this could be huge if this thing gets through. For everything you said and mm -hmm. what I just said and several other angles, it's going to be messy from a recruiting and other standpoint as well. Yeah, so, I think, go ahead, sir. So also, would we be then required to accept students up to X level of capacity or percent of capacity? My understanding is, is that what, well, again, it's not finalized yet, but what I have seen is that the district would set, so you all, uh, we would sit and we would um, talk about a policy and you would set that policy. Uh, so again, I don't know, they haven't finalized it, but that's my understanding. The other thing, um, hopefully, if this does pass, um, they've given us some time to put those policies in place. So uh, in, in conjunction with all the other comments, one of the other pieces, I don't, I don't think we've hit, and if we 
did, then I apologize. But if the um, number of kids where does that money come from to support those kids um, as it relates to the amount of money the district receives and can can spend on education for that year so first of all to be clear uh, my guess is part of our policy would be you have to be here by this date okay. and I, I don't want to speak for the board, but that would certainly be our recommendation is that there's a date. But say that they were there by that date, okay. and then they <laughs> didn't follow through with the attendance uh, the way they were supposed to, um, and so they weren't here on September 20th, and they didn't do the before. I mean, there's some other things you can look into. We, it would just come for, we would have to, we would have to pay for it. Out of the general fund. Out of the general fund. Yes. And, and, and which kids? Uh, are most impacted by the general fund spending? Well, every kid is. I mean, which group of kids? It's obviously not necessarily special education, right? But I would say it's every other kid. Right, um, it's every other yeah. kid, right? Yep. Class sizes. Class sizes, class offerings, yes. uh, paras. Middle school, you know, sports, everything. Mm -hmm. everything. When, I, when I try to do easy math just to understand <laughs> the base base state aid come in with a student, and then I look at the numbers we went over this morning, I mean, unless the weightings are really heavy, a lot of that comes from our local option budget, and... Yeah. You did the math right here on that. Yeah. So it just feels like even even if you ne didn't have any special ed, if people needing special ed services, it would still be a uh, deficit. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree. It sounds like it's a, a suburban versus other parts of the state issue. I really think that's the way it's shaping yeah. up. Would, would that create some potential unsettling during the school year from a budget standpoint? Would we have to do cuts, for an example? Um, no, again, I think we would we would set our limit. Okay. So we, we would have to make sure that didn't happen. Okay. So we would have to wrestle, if this passes, with what are the limits that we're going to allow, what are the dates, and you know, Jody, I think, is the one who asked earlier, did we say, do we say no? We're not good at saying no. We would have to say no. We would have to say, nope, this is it. This is the, the date. Um, you're a day late. Sorry. I mean, this is the date. Probably would, it would have to be that. But again, this board would have to wrestle with those policies of what that would look like. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Or the thing I just want to remind everybody is that we do have a, a legislative page on our district website with this information. So... One more one question. Mm -hmm. So what can we do or what can parents do now, between now and I guess when the veto session starts, to try to affect change in this way? It um, seems like I think that they uh, can, one thing I would say is uh, they have opinions. Um, they are always welcome to contact their legislator and, and share their opinion with them. Do you know, if, does our delegation largely support these? in the same way we do? Do you know? Um. <coughs> they can write their governor as well. Mm -hmm. Is this a, is this, was this like party line type votes on, on this issue? Uh, uh, probably. I didn't, I haven't looked at the actual uh, votes, uh, but I would say probably. Yes. Close. Anything else? No. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Merrigan. Okay. Uh, we are now to the end of our meeting. Do I have a motion? I move that the April 11th regular Board of Education meeting be adjourned. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing no discussion. All in favor raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0.